Senator Buck? Senator Buck? Here. Senator Scheibel? I'm here, and I think we have an action going on. Do we have an echo? Assemblywoman Constantine. Present. Present. Assemblyman MacArthur. Here. Vice, Vice Chair Spearman. Here. And Chair Gorlo. Here. Here. Madam Secretary, please indicate all committee members are present. And I would like to thank everyone in the audience for in Las Vegas, those joining us by video conference in Carson City, and also anyone listening over the internet. I would like to take a few moments to introduce members of the committee and committee staff. Members, if you each would like to introduce yourself, please indicate your district you represent, as well as the goals that you have for the committee for the 2021-22 interim. Let us begin with our vice chair, Senator Spearman. I thought you were going to say the best for last. I'm <laughs> just joking. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, State Senator Pat Spearman. I represent Senate District 1, which is uh, more than 90% of North Las Vegas and have been uh, representing this district since 2012. Mm -hmm. um, I am really concerned or want to make sure that during the uh, this interim uh, time in this committee, I want to make sure that we're focusing on some of the specific things that have affected not just our veterans solely and not just our seniors solely and not just our adults with special needs, but I believe that uh, those three demographics overlap because we have veterans who are seniors uh, that have special needs. We have uh, people who have special needs uh, who are veterans. And so I'm looking to make sure that everything that we discuss and all of the recommendations that we put forth for the next uh, legislative session are taking into account uh, not just the concentric circles, but how they all overlap and um, want to make myself available for any questions or any type of um, expertise I might be able to lend as a um, former member of the military as a veteran. So uh, that's kind of the rough way I'm looking at it, Madam, <laughs> Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to go first and not last. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Senator Spearman. Uh, next, Senator Scheibel. Thank you so much, Chair Gorlo. Uh, my name is Melanie Scheibel. I am a state senator for District 9, which is in the southwest part of Las Vegas. I'm excited to serve on this committee, learn more about um, how our state is serving veterans, people uh, with disabilities and the aging community, and to uh, continue working to make our, our state a better place. Thank you very much. And Senator Buck. Good morning, um, Chair and committee members. Um, my name is Carrie Buck. I am um, the sitting senator for Senate District 5 here in Henderson. Um, I look forward to learning a lot about our senior community, uh, veterans issues um, in this committee as well as um, potential mental health, health care uh, for these uh, various constituencies. So thank you. Thank you very much. Assemblywoman Considine. Good morning. Hi, I'm Venetia Considine, Assemblywoman for District 18, which is on the east side of Las Vegas and parts of Henderson. I am um, honored to be on this committee and I look forward to learning more about this committee and working on quality of life issues for senior citizens, veterans, and adults with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Assemblyman MacArthur. Thank you. Um, happy to be here. My name is Richard MacArthur. I represent Assembly District 4, which is in the far northwest part of uh, Las Vegas. Um, this committee is new for me. Uh, I'm very interested in finding out uh, all the information we have on senior citizens, veterans, and that sort of thing. So I'm just happy to be here. So thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm Assemblywoman Michelle Gorlo. This is my first session chairing this amazing committee. 
um, a little bit about my background. Oh, first, I represent Assembly District 35. Um, that is Mountain's Edge in Southern Highlands, so I'm in the far southwest. And a little bit about my background. I work for a nonprofit that provides health care to children in Southern Nevada. For over 20 years, I've worked a lot with um, health care for women and children, uh, especially children with disabilities. And um, I find that there's a lot of crossover when we talk about our pediatric population and our seniors and adults with special needs and even our veteran population as well. So I look forward to having very robust conversations in this interim and um, putting together some really great legislation for next session. I would also like to take a moment to introduce staff. First we have Ashley Kalina, who is the lead policy analysis for the committee with Cesar Milligar. I knew I was going to pronounce it wrong. <laughs> we even practiced it. Melgarejo, he's senior policy analyst, also assisting. We have Eric Roberts, who is our legal counsel, and Jan Brace in Carson City is the committee secretary. Also, we have Kimbra Ellsworth, and she is the fiscal analyst assigned to the committee. However, Brody Leisure will be standing in for Ms. Ellsworth today. I want to thank you and staff and everyone um, for all you do to support this committee in the interim. Your assistance is truly invaluable. We'd also like to extend a thank you to the Broadcast and Production Services and Las Vegas Administrative Division of the Legislative Council Bureau for all of their behind the scenes work in video conferencing and helping the meeting run smoothly. A little bit of housekeeping before we begin. I'd like to take a moment to go over some basic items. This committee is scheduled to meet four times during the interim and Las Vegas will serve as our primary meeting location. Our meetings are video conference to Carson City. While everyone is encouraged to participate from whichever location is most convenient, we are willing and able to have these meetings made available by way of virtual participation as well. Everyone should sign in the sign-in sheet, which is located at the back of the room. Even if you do not wish to testify, please sign in. When testifying, please remember to turn on your microphone and clearly state your name and the entity you represent at the beginning of your testimony. Speak directly into the microphone to ensure those listening in other locations and watching online can hear your testimony. Please remember to turn the microphone off when you finish speaking. And you will note that the microphone button will light up, so if you do push and it doesn't light up, please push it again. Each witness should provide a business card and a copy of any written materials not previously submitted to the secretary. And since our committee secretary is in Carson City, please leave your business card on the witness table or at the back by the sign-in sheets in Las Vegas. Our staff will collect your cards at the end of the meeting. Witnesses who wish to provide committee members with additional information or have their complete testimony or handouts included in the permanent record of this meeting should provide a paper or electronic copy to the secretary. You can find her contact information on the committee's website. Remember that minutes of the meeting are produced in a summary format and are not verbatim. Meeting materials provided to committee members for this meeting can be accessed on the committee's webpage. Individual public copies are also available in each meeting location. Anyone who would like to receive electronic notification of and access to the committee's agenda, minutes, and final report can do so by going to the Nevada Legislator's website and following the links. And I believe that website is nv.state.nv.us. And finally, please turn off your cell phones or put it on silent one in the committee. So thank you very much. And with that, we'll get started. Our first, or second, is actually the second agenda item is public comment. I would like to call your attention to the notation on the agenda limiting public comments to three minutes. Speakers are urged to avoid repeating comments or points made by previous speakers. Any person may submit written comment to the committee secretary during or after today's meeting. I want the public to know that public comment may be provided in four different ways, which are listed on the agenda. You can call 1-669-900-6833, then enter meeting ID 827-2656. 0830 and then pressing pound. Let me repeat that. The number is 1-669-900-6833 and the meeting ID is 827-2656-0830. Then press pound. You can also email comments to seniorvetaawsn at lcb dot state dot nv dot us so again senior vet a a w s n at lcb dot state dot nv dot us and mailing written comments to the research division 401 south carson street carson city nevada 
8-9701 or faxing 775-684-6400. Let's first take a public comment on the phone. LCB, do we have anybody on the phone for public comment? Thank you, Chair Gorlow. To provide public comment, please press star nine on your phone to take your place in the queue. Caller, you're unmuted. Please begin. Hello, uh, Chair Gorlo and committee members. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for your time. My name is Raquel O'Neill. I am a licensed clinical social worker and president of Blind Connect. I am coming before you this morning with a couple of opening stories. I want to tell you a couple of real life stories to draw your attention to some needs in our state. First of all, in 2006, Angela Hoffman was an individual who lost her eyesight in her 30s. She had coped with a progressive vision loss and she was successful in her marriage and with her children. And eventually after losing the rest of her eyesight, she was searching for resources and help. Due to the cost of needing to go out of state for these rehabilitative services to learn how to cook eggs for her children again or provide them help with their homework or even walk to her mailbox to find out where to get her mail, she learned that these services costed her family forty to $60,000 as she herself did not want to go through vocational rehabilitation in order to stay home and raise her family. Unfortunately, in the prime of Angela's life, we lost her. She decided to commit suicide due to her vision loss. Secondly, I'd like to tell you the story of Jose. Jose is an individual who lost his eyesight last year in May of 2021 to diabetic retinopathy. He is 44 years old. And after losing his eyesight from diabetic retinopathy, he was immediately hospitalized. During his hospitalization, they were unsure of how to monitor his blood sugars due to his vision loss. The hospital retained him in a mental health facility for four and a half months until he was able to secure a rehabilitation space at Blind Connect. Blind Connect is a nonprofit organization that has served Nevada since 1998. Our mission is to provide the much needed rehabilitation services for Nevada citizens experiencing vision loss. In our United States, when an individual loses a limb or a part of physical functioning, they typically go to acute care facilities and rehabilitation services, receiving daily support and rehabilitation therapies, like occupational therapy and physical therapy. However, when you lose your eyesight as a small child, adult, senior, or veteran, you do not get those the same services. Many people all over the state of Nevada lose their eyesight and an ophthalmological visit and cannot even drive themselves home, but home is where they are told to go. Blind Connect is here to offer rehabilitation services that are vital to somebody losing the loss of their eyesight. We would humbly like to request that this committee review rehabilitation services for the blind in Nevada. I have provided some attached documents for your review and we are humbly requesting that you look at providing funding for Blind Connect to continue to do what we do best, which is provide hope for a brighter future for Nevada citizens who are experiencing vision loss.
Thank you once very again, much, Paula. So, excuse me, Chair. Uh, once again, we are currently in public comment. If you would like to provide public comment, please press star nine on your phone to take your place in the queue. Caller, you are unmuted. Please begin. Thank you so much. Um, good morning. This is Dora Martinez, D-O-R-A-M-A-R-T-I-N-E-V. Good morning, Chair Gorlo and Vice Chair Freeman and the rest of your <clears throat> most exciting and outstanding um, interim committee of all time. And thank you for not um, getting rid of this important committee. This is where people, um, seniors and veterans and disabled or people with disability can come and be heard and, and hopefully um, our voice is, is, you know, our opinion are counted. Um, so um, I'm in a hurry. Sorry, I'm, I have to be at the Washoe County Commissioner's meeting. Our, our, our vote is, our freedom to vote is in, at, um, at stake. So I'm kind of walking and, and talking at the same time. So I just want to say thank you so much um, for all that you do. And also to bring attention, I am a blind mom, a proud mom of uh, two kids who are um, in the military, National Guard and, and Army. Um, one of our friends who is part of my Nevada Disability Peer Action Coalition asked me to, to um, tell a little bit a story of her. She is visually impaired and hard of hearing. And she, when the RTC went on strike um, three times last year and, and beginning of this year a little bit, she was unable to get secured aid transportation to her um, um, dialysis. And we are humbly asking, because not all Medicaid or Medicare um, insurance are covered for transportation. And we are all asking, I hear um, Cheyenne and, and Ricky Robin and, and other people are on this uh, presentation uh, with agenda. I'm, we are asking uh, that transportation would be added in Medicaid and home care visits. So even if access, RTC paratransit for Washoe County or RTC RUD is not um, uh, available, Due to strike or, or lack of drivers uh, because they don't give them uh, respectable wages, that they are covered so they don't um, lose their appointment, their dialysis appointment or eye doctor or any type of that sort of thing or pharmacy to go pick up their medicine. Uh, we all know that post office is kind of slow. And so when they are um, can't deliver their um, medication on time, that a person can... Um, get a Uber or Lyft if RTC paratransit are not running to go get their um, medication. Thank you so much for all that you guys do. Please enjoy your day and happy spring and, and um, happy Disability Awareness Month. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Ms. Martinez. Next caller. Chair Gorlo, the line is open and working. However, there are no additional callers at this time. Thank you very much. Are there anyone in Las Vegas who would like to do public comment? Please come to the table. Welcome. Thank you. Um, good Please morning. have a seat. Oh, <laughs> perfect. I'll do it. <laughs> All right. Good morning. My name is Brittany Richards, um, and I want to thank the chair and committee for uh, your time today. I'm the area director for Chrysalis Las Vegas, a member of SNAP, the Southern Nevada, Nevada Association of Providers. Um, we, my agency specifically works with the Aging and Disability Services Division. Uh, across the state of Nevada right now, Chrysalis is the largest provider serving people with intellectual disabilities in their homes and workplaces, and we employ about 500 people to provide these supports. We support people with cleaning, providing supervision to them, personal hygiene, cooking, medication, medical appointments, behavior management, outings and integration into their communities and just getting up and getting dressed for their, their day. Um, and I wanna tell you guys about my experiences with how the staffing crisis over the last two years has impacted individuals with disabilities and the, the staff that care for them. 
The staffing shortages have made it extremely difficult to find and keep qualified people to work with Nevada's most vulnerable population and citizens. Uh, staff that do stay are sacrificing at great personal lengths just to take care of the people that they love um, um, and support, okay? Uh, they're burnt out. These heroes are burnt out and they're struggling because there's not enough people to care for our disabled population. Across Nevada, uh, disability agencies, staff turnover is at 132%. What's worse is the staff vacancies are currently at 22%, and that's more than one out of every five positions that are vacant right now. I can tell you about Shayla, uh, who's postponed her family's moving day since December at her own personal expense and put herself in a hotel because she couldn't justify leaving her disabled individuals with, with intellectual disabilities to move her family. I could tell you about Ronisha, who finally had a day off and was called back to the house, back to her workhouse, because the staff there was overworked and the relief that was supposed to show didn't. Um, so she went and paid at her expense to go get a babysitter and go back to the house to take care of her individuals with disabilities. I can go on and on and on, and I had a list of all of these different stories of all the things that our, our teams are doing in heroic efforts to take care of our, our disabled community. Um, and they're sacrificing their own personal lives to help people that we serve. My agency and many agencies have done everything in their power from the top down to support the staff administrators, administration, and I myself have worked in these homes to make sure that the staff ha or the individuals have exactly what they need and routinely work shifts to do this. Nevada's disability providers are the safety net for Ms. Nevada. Richard, you have 30 seconds. Okay. okay. We're thankful that ADSD has told us that Hopefully by the month's end, we'll be receiving the ARPA funds to supplement home and community-based services with a temporary 26.9%. We are going to ask that it be considered that these funds become ongoing because one-time funds are good for bonuses, but not for wages. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to make public comment in Las Vegas? Seeing none, we will move to Carson City. Is there anyone in Carson City who would like to make public comment? There's no public comment here in Carson City, Chair. Thank you very much. Hey, agenda item three, the overview of the committee's responsibilities and activities. We'll have our committee policy analysis, Ashley Kalina, provide an overview of the committee and our responsibilities. So thank you, Ms. Kalina. Good morning and thank you, Chair Gorlo. For the record, my name is Ashley Kalina. I am your nonpartisan committee policy analyst. As nonpartisan staff of the Legislative Council Bureau, I can neither advocate nor oppose for any of the proposals that come before you. My role is to assist the committee as a whole and each of you as individual legislators, while also providing policy and research needs to help you make informed decisions about the issues reviewed and studied by this committee. Um, before you is a copy of the committee work plan. It is also available on the committee uh, web page. The work plan provides background information on the powers and duties of the committee, a glimpse of the work of the committee during the previous interim, our proposed meeting schedule, and committee staff contact information. I just want to take a few minutes to cover some highlights. Um, first, uh, let's go over the responsibilities of the committee. Uh, Nevada Revised Statutes Chapter 218E, Section 760, establishes the general powers of the Legislative Committee on senior citizens, veterans, and adults with special needs. The committee is charged with reviewing, studying, and commenting on issues relating to senior citizens, veterans, and adults with special needs. These general powers are outlined on the first and second page of the work plan. In addition to the powers outlined in the previously mentioned section of NRS, the committee has a duty to review certain statutory reports from the Purchasing Division and the State Public Works Division of the Department of Administration. These divisions are required to report to the committee on the number and dollar amount of purchasing contracts and contracts awarded 
to local businesses that are owned by service disabled veterans. These reports are required to be submitted to the committee during the interim period. On page two and continuing on to page three, uh, this contains information about the bills proposed by the committee during the last interim. I'd like to point out that of the eight BDRs proposed by the committee for the 2021 legislative session, two bills, Assembly Bill 407 and Assembly Bill 439, did not move beyond the first House committee passage. Assembly Bill 407 would have facilitated a vulnerable adult's ability to obtain a protective order on their own and also allow adult protective services to petition the court on their behalf. Assembly Bill 439 would have required state occupational licensing boards to streamline the process for military spouses to attain professional licenses. Assembly Bill 443 from the 2021 Nevada Legislature changed the number of bills allocated to the committee from 10 to 6. You will see that the committee may submit up to six BDRs for consideration by the 2023 legislative session. The BDRs must be submitted to the legal division of the LCB on or before September 1st, 2022. And on page three of the work plan, you will find the proposed committee meeting dates for the 2021-2022 interim. This committee has been allocated funds to meet four times during the interim. A work session will be conducted at the last committee meeting, which is currently scheduled for Tuesday, August 16th, excuse me, August 16th, 2022. Finally, you will find a list of our committee staff and their contact information. There's also a page that outlines potential topics for discussion at the future committee meetings. As I mentioned in the beginning, I am available to assist the committee and its members on any issues related to matters before the committee. In addition, the employees of the research division are available to provide information and assistance on a confidential basis to individual members of the legislature on any topic. Chair Gorlow, this concludes my presentation and I welcome any questions. Thank you, Ms. Kalina. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none, um, then we'll go on to our next agenda item which is a presentation regarding the programs and services provided by the Aging and Disability Services Division of the Department of Health and Human Services. We have Ms. Jessica Adams, Deputy Administrator, ADSD, DHHS, Ricky Robb, Deputy Administrator, and Carrie Embry, Governor's Consumer Health Advocate. I believe they will all be participating via Zoom. Do we have them available? Good morning. For the record, this is Carrie Embry, Governor's Consumer Health Advocate. And with me this morning is Jessica Adams, Deputy Administrator, and Ricky Robb, Deputy Administrator. We appreciate this opportunity to share with the committee information about Aging and Disability Services Division who we are and what we do. And these are the topics we will be covering this morning. Aging and Disability Services Division is dedicated to providing individuals and, and families with effective supports and services. Our programs, services, and staff consistently seek to understand and be responsive to the individual. The division serves populations from birth to death. We do this by providing services in the individual's home, supporting caregivers, and providing advocacy services. Moving on to advocacy services, the Office for Consumer Health Assistance has a team of six consumer health advocates that specialize in educating and advocating all Nevadans regarding their healthcare needs. The most common complaints we educate and provide advocacy for include billing issues and access to healthcare, such as uh, assistance finding specialty providers and or medical treatments. For example, we had a case where an individual had reached out to the Office for Consumer Health Assistance. The individual had shared 
with the Office for Consumer Health Assistance that he had a rare life-threatening disease that he was recently diagnosed with. His health plan approved a specialized treatment at the Mayo Clinic, which was out of state, and the Mayo Clinic scheduled the treatment. All the logistics in place for this individual to transfer out of state and receive this treatment was all set up and arranged. However, as the date got close for this individual to travel, the Mayo Clinic notified the individual that their health plan had not provided the authorization needed to cover the treatment. So either this individual had to cover the treatment himself or uh, try to get it resolved with the health plan. So this individual did reach out to his health plan, plan, tried to get this sorted out and it wasn't working and time was of the essence in this situation. The individual reached out to OCHA and the advocate, advocate was able to intervene and advocate for the individual and with the health plan in order to get that authorization uh, in place at the Mayo Clinic in time for the individual to receive the treatment. The consumer health advocates also complete arbitrations to resolve disputes between out-of-network providers of healthcare and health plans. For consumers who go to the emergency room for medically necessary emergency services, Nevada law prevents consumers from receiving a surprise bill from the out-of-network provider or the out-of-network uh, hospital where they received the medically necessary emergency services. As a result, these arbitrations have saved consumers from getting a bill and so far have saved consumers for fiscal year 22 through September or through February, $212,000, uh, uh, well, specifically $212,000, $881. The Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program provides advocacy for individuals living in skilled nursing facilities and group homes and homes for individual residential care. You'll hear a bit more from our state long-term care ombudsman, Jennifer Williams-Woods, later in this presentation. In federal fiscal year 2020, residents in skilled nursing facilities, their top five complaints were discharge and eviction dignity and respect, physical abuse, financial exploitation, and care planning. For residents in group homes and homes for indi individual residential care, the five top complaints that our long-term care ombudsman advocated for individuals for were financial exploitation, discharge and eviction, gross neglect, dignity and respect, and resident representative or family conflicts. The rights attorney is with Aging and Disability Services Division and the individual who is our rights attorney, Jennifer Richards, uh, is in this position and you'll be hearing more from Jennifer Richards in future meetings. The rights attorney provides regulatory policy and advocacy for the division. The rights attorney also provides technical assistance and education within the division's programs, such as adult protective services, the long-term care ombudsman, office for consumer health assistance, as well as developmental services and community-based care programs. This advocacy often involves complex legal issues such as evictions, power of attorney, and guardianships. Adult Protective Services investigates reports of maltreatment of vulnerable adults age 18 and older. Investigations begin within three working days of receipt of the report. Reports <clears throat> Uh, reports concerning high risk of maltreatment are responded to within 24 hours. Most often these high risk reports are responded to the same day as the report is received. 
Adult Protective Services also provides ancillary services, such as emergency homemaker services, a psychiatrist to complete mental health evaluations, and a forensic medical specialist. Of the allegations that Adult Protective Services investigates, the most uh, uh, reports are for self-neglect. These are the highest number of reports for Elder Protective Services. This is followed by abuse, exploitation, then neglect, isolation, and the lowest number of reports come in for abandonment. These four programs, the Office of Consumer Health Assistance, the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program, the Rights Attorney, and Adult Protective Services have specialized knowledge and expertise advocating for Nevadans. In so doing, they refer individuals to other programs within the division. I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Jessica Adams to share more information about other programs and services. Thank you. Good morning. I am Jessica Adams, one of the Deputy Administrators for Aging and Disability Services. Um, today, I'm going to be presenting information on our developmental services and community-based care programs. So developmental services serves people of any age um, with a intellectual or developmental disability. A intellectual disability is characterized by significant limitations in both intellectual functioning and adaptive skills. Um, it typically occurs before the age of 18 and is considered a, a lifelong condition. Um, developmental disabilities um, are severe chronic disabilities attributed to neurological or genetic disorders found to be closely related to a intellectual disability because the condition results in impairment of general intellectual functioning and or results in adaptive behavior deficits similar to that of a person with a intellectual disability. Um, developmental disabilities must occur before the age of 22. Once a person is qualified for de developmental services, they are served through one of three regional centers. Sierra Regional Center serves Washoe County, Desert Regional Center serves urban Clark County, and Rural Regional Center serves the rest of the state um, through eight offices um, with their central office based in Carson City and offices um, going up the, the northern part of the state all the way out to Elko and then down in the, in the southern rural areas of Mesquite and Haram. Um, developmental services serves roughly 7,500 people. Um, of those people, about 77% are adults over the age of 18 with the other 23% under age 18. Um, our largest pop population is with Desert Regional Center with about 69% of uh, people residing in urban Clark County. Um, within the regional centers, we have service coordination. Um, so anyone who qualifies for a, a regional center is assigned a, a service coordinator that can help that family or the individual find the services that they may need. They can help with things like meetings with um, schools, helping somebody connect with vocational rehab, um, basically anything that that person may uh, need uh, as a result of their disability. Within the regional centers, we also have a psychological services unit um, that consists of licensed psychologists as well as mental health counselors. They can do assessments, counseling, um, special training, things along, along those lines. And then we also have nurses. Um, they mostly help with things like discharge planning um, or also help families um, with any, any special care needs that that person may have. We have two family su support programs. Um, within family support, we have respite, um, which is a $125 a month that goes to the family. Um, they are able to then choose who they want to spend money with, whether it's a program or it's a um, it, individual person to, to provide that, that brief break in uh, care that that family may need. We also have something called the self-directed family support program which is $450 a month for that family to buy um, a specialized services that, that isn't going to be covered by any sort of other, other, other program. Um, examples are things like music therapy, 
um, horseback riding therapy, um, things along, along those lines. The Family Preservation Program is $374 a month. That goes to any person living in their family home that has a severe or profound intellectual dis disability. These individuals often have um, higher level of need. And so therefore we are able to give that family a small amount of money to be able to help pay for their, for their care needs in the actual home. Um, and then our biggest programs are our supportive living arrangement programs and jobs and day training programs. Um, these are done by contracted providers across the state. Um, we have a network um, and they are able to um, make sure that people, mostly adults, are living full lives. Um, so, so supportive living arrangements are residential programs um, that can be on a, a large spectrum of a service from a few hours a day, a few hours a week, all the way up to 24 hour services in a, um, in a home setting. Jobs and day training services can be all sorts of different services that just give that person something to do during the day. Um, it can be learning more life skills. It can be learning additional work skills so they can hopefully get a job out in a competitive environment. And then we also have, have services that can help keep that person um, in their com competitive job. Behavioral consultation and nutritional counseling are also services that are contracted out to pro provider agencies. Um, you will be hearing more about these services in the next presentation on home and co community-based waivers. Um, the waiver is one of the main funding sources of these services that we contract out to different agencies. Next slide. Desert Regional Center down in Las, Las Vegas operates the only state-run intermediate care facility for people with in intellectual disabilities or ICF for short. Um, we are licensed for 48 beds. We currently have 40 people residing on the campus. Um, one of the reasons that we do are not at full ca capacity is we, well, we have two different, different reasons for that. Um, one, we have 11 separate homes on the campus. Uh, one of these homes has had to be used as a quarantine isolation area um, due to COVID. And a, another home um, has been in a ADA remodel. Um, and that's been a long-term project as, as, as we've worked through each of those homes. Um, so we actually don't have enough beds um, to be able to serve all, all 48 people at this point in time. The other main issue that we have at the ICF is we are experiencing a major staffing shortage. Um, our developmental support tech technicians are the jobs that do the day-to-day uh, 24 -day, hour services. Um, we are cur currently vacant 28 jobs, um, which is about 25% of all of the techs that we need to operate the actual campus. Um, within the ICF, this really provides 24 hour services. Again, this is a facility-based setting as opposed to a home and community-based setting. There has to be active treatments happening um, to make sure that we are pr promoting functional skills. Um, and it includes a whole lot of different services, um, nursing, counseling, physical therapy, speech therapy, um, basically anything that, that that person needs to be able to be healthy and reside successfully at the ICF. Okay, I'm gonna move on to community-based care or CBC. The two main programs operated by CBC are our other two 1915C home and community-based waivers that operate in the state, the Frail Elderly Waiver. Um, this is for people who are over the age of 65 um, and qualify for the um, uh, qualify for Medicaid. Um, you will be hearing a lot more about all of these different services again in the next present presentation. Um, the persons with physical disabilities waiver. Um, again, this, this serves anybody um, who has a physical disability. Um, the purpose of all, of all of these programs are to make sure that the person can reside successfully in the community as opposed to needing a um, 
institutional settings, such as a skilled nursing home. Um, and all services are based on need and determined by the social health assessment, which is done on at least an annual basis. There are three more programs that community-based care operates. These are all state-funded programs. The community services option program for the elderly. Um, this currently has 82 people on this, this uh, program. They must be uh, 65 years of age or older, um, are typically a low-income person, but are not qualifying for Medicaid for whatever reason. Um, they are also able to then receive um, small, small amounts of uh, services such as um, personal care services, homemaker services, respite, um, things that are going to, again, allow the person to remain in their home. The personal uh, assistance program or PAS, um, this is anyone who's 18 or older, again, is not going to qualify for Medicaid. Um, the way that this program is written is it is specifically for people who do not qualify for Medicaid and go up to higher income limits because this is not a service that is often um, uh, often covered by private insurance agencies. Mostly um, the services re revolve around the personal care that that person needs to stay in their or in their uh, home. And then the Taxi Assistance Program, or TAP, um, for this program, it is um, it only operates in urban Las Vegas. Um, people are, are able to buy discounted coupon books for taxi fares. Um, so for they would get a coupon worth $20 worth of taxi fare, and then they only pay five or $10 um, for that coupon based on their income. Um, and so now I'm going to turn it over to Ricky Robb to talk about the rest of our programs. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Ricky Robb. I'm um, one of the deputy administrators for Aging and Disability Services. And I'm going to start on slide 13. And we're going to be talking about initially our planning, advocacy, and community-based service unit, um, also known as PAC. So you've just heard about a variety of services and programs offered by community-based care unit and developmental services, and as well as OCHA. Um, this, this unit is a unique unit, and um, we have the privilege of having probably the smallest but most mighty group <laughs> that oversees this unit. Um, as you can see on this slide, we have a variety of functions, which includes oversight of strategic planning, various state plans, advocacy bodies, as well as contracts to support um, our community provider network. We also oversee Nevada 211, which consists of information and referral call center and a website for Nevada Relay. Um, we oversee the sign language interpreter registry uh, for the deaf and hard of hearing and also have an interpreter mentoring program. Uh, we also have the program for seniors and disability prescription drugs. Uh, which has been a Medicare Part D support program over the last several years. On slide 14, uh, these are some of the federal grants and state funding accounts that accounts to approximately $28 million um, annually. Um, and these are federal pass-through dollars as well as a state general fund. We fund those out to our community providers who provide the actual direct service. The PAC unit is an indirect service program, but it is a, basically our grants management unit for aging and disability services. And so that pass through funding goes directly to those community partners and nonprofits and, and the different counties throughout the state. And they provide vital in-home and community-based services for older adults, people with disabilities and family caregivers. Um, we have highlighted a few of the home and community-based services the PAC unit currently funds, but I'd like to note that um, the, unit, the unit grants out approximately $28 million annually, and um, they're mainly, mainly, again, made up of those federal funding. During the pandemic, this unit also was granted um, directly from uh, the feds for COVID response. And it was approximately $18 million in emergency funding to support the vulnerable individuals during the pandemic. 
as we all know, our older Nevadans were um, the most vulnerable population that we needed to support. The PAC unit was able to truly jump in, um, create multiple programs on the fly and, and support the entire system for our most vulnerable uh, groups during the COVID pandemic. As you can see, we also have multiple programs that are on the day-to-day, -day, whether it be the in-home services, uh, nutrition, uh, they support all of the funding for the older adults um, and Older Americans Act funding that goes for home delivered meals and congregate meals. And during the pandemic, we were not able to utilize those congregate settings. And so we had to uh, take other opportunities to ensure that those older Nevadans received their um, deliver their meals delivered to their homes. Transportation, caregiver support, uh, the Nevada Care Connection um, and navigation and assistance to uh, long-term supports and services services, su support services, my apologies, um, is also where individuals can either call or go into a center and, and receive supports for their families uh, for whatever their needs may or may not be uh, in their homes or through group settings. Our assistive technology and independent living services uh, is to really support an individual to remain in their home, to live as independently as possible. We also provide legal assistance and then um, health promotion services. The next program that I will be discussing is Nevada Early Intervention Services, which is um, our most vulnerable youngest uh, Nevadans, which is our birth to three. And those individual children uh, receive support and services um, based on a diagnosis uh, um, of a disability or a developmental delay. Uh, these children could be medically fragile. Uh, we also support children who are in the child protective um, system. And so we uh, support them in service coordination, special instruction. Uh, we have on-site audiologists. And then depending upon the needs of the child and their developmental uh, delays, they may receive occupational, physical, or speech therapies to support them to um, become age appropriate within their development. One of the things I'd like to highlight with this program is that we, over the years, we have had um, a lot of changes and this program truly has not been looked at since the ACA was put in place. And so we're in the process currently of doing a full system analysis of Nevada Early Intervention Services. And our hope is that we will be able to look at the full spectrum of services that we provide, as well as ensure that we have an appropriate structure for um, the community providers and the state providers who provide those services. We're also in the process of working through an RFP with purchasing to look at a comprehensive case management system, which will ensure uh, better efficiencies as well as supports for those families who receive care within early intervention services. And below, you'll see that we have two different um, single points of entry for both the Southern and Northern, Northern Nevada areas. The last program that I'll be talking about is the Autism Treatment Assistance Program. Um, this program is an assistance program to support families to obtain um, services and uh, therapies for individuals under the age of 20 who have been diagnosed with autism um, spectrum disorder. And so this really focuses on the supports and services to uh, support that individual to have an independent um, opportunity as, as they uh, go into adulthood. So the main focus that we work on is applied behavioral analysis, which is ABA therapy. And so we uh, support the families in uh, obtaining a provider who is um, certified and able to support that family based on the individual's needs. And then as you'll see, there's additional types of um, treatments funded as intensive parent training which has really increased over the last um, two years with the pandemic. Since we weren't able to go into the individual homes, we were able to do some additional training to support those families as we moved forward. Um, we also received a rate increase in the last biennium to support our um, registered behavioral technicians to provide the ABA um, therapies into the 
in the um, individual's homes. So I'm excited to say that we've been working to uh, reduce the wait list for um, ATAP uh, services, and we are being quite successful at that at this time. Then on slide 17, um, I would just like to take a brief moment. You'll hear more about this as we move forward, but we have definitely felt the effects of COVID and the critical shortage um, for staffing has affected our vacancy rate. So you will be able to see here anywhere from 15 to 50% vacancy rates based on the programs that we provide through aging and disability services. So we truly have felt the, the impact to that. And um, you know it is our hope that through this next legislative session that we'll be able to address those concerns and those <coughs> On slide 18, um, due to the critical shortages in staffing and, and the challenges that we have faced, we obviously can see that we have um, an impact to our division caseloads. So I would like to thank you for um, listening to this first presentation. I believe we have four today for you. So this is the first of four. And thank you for hearing us today. And uh, we are open for any questions you may have. Thank you very much for your presentations. Um, I think I will kick off the questions. Going back to the Desert Regional Center, you would mentioned one of the homes was being remodeled to be ADA compliant. Do you have an anticipated date on when that would be completed? Jessica Adams, for the record, um, the work was finished, um, and then the Department of Healthcare Quality and Com Compliance, which is who licenses that home, um, recently went in last week to do an inspection um, and unfortunately found some more things that uh, need to be fixed. So at this point, I do not have a date. Thank you for that. Um, let me open up the questions to other committee members and then we'll circle back because I have a couple more. So are there other committee members that have questions? And the, the, Senator Spearman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just have a couple of questions. Uh, thank you, first of all, for the uh, very thorough uh, report. Um, one of the things that became quite noticeable during COVID is the unevenness uh, of the healthcare uh, delivery system um, with, with respect to uh, BIPOC communities. Uh, you gave a really good detailed uh, report about how the response was for COVID. I am anxious to understand uh, how that impacted uh, not just BIPOC communities, but also members of the LGBTQ community from an emotional and uh, psychological standpoint. Um, because it was my experience here on the ground that there was a great deal of suffering, a great deal of confusion as to where they might be able to go for resources, uh, where they might be able to go for help. And I think what our uh, the basic response was uh, a big umbrella, one over the world. You can go to this place and they are uh, addressing issues um, uh, for the masses of community, but many people in BIPOC communities um, uh, were not able, either were not able to get there or uh, because the level of trust wasn't there. Uh, and sometimes it's just a matter of, um, of us at the state level not really understanding where um, when the rubber meets the road, where those people are located and how we might be able to do a better job um, interacting with them. I hope that, hope that question makes sense, but I'm looking, have we done anything to break it down uh, demographically? That's the question. Ricky Rob, for the record, I, I think this is something that, um, to be honest, it's it's an ongoing um, opportunity for us. So I, I would not be able to answer to you today on the specifics, but what I will say is that it is something that um, is that we're working on and will continue to work on, and, um, and and we are learning more about those communities and where we should and can go to support them. Um, but I, I don't have that information today to be able to answer that question specifically, but we'll be happy to take that back as a group and, um, and, and see what information we can pull together for you, Senator. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, follow up, please. 
Uh, yeah, and, and I asked that yes, question please. because yeah, it, it, because this is something, this is an ongoing uh, concern for me. And every time we have had, uh, even during the last interim, um, this committee and others uh, asking the question, what, if anything, have we done to address um, concerns uh, with any degree of specificity for uh, BIPOC and other marginalized uh, communities? I know for a fact, um, especially in uh, Senate District 1, I was getting a lot of calls from people who just had no idea where to go for resources. And even when they went to the places uh, where it was suggested resources, they could receive uh, information on resources. Uh, sometimes people were unaware of the um, specific nuances, if you will, that affected people in those communities. And I'm not just talking about ethnicities, but I'm also speaking about a large number of people in the um, LGBTQ um, community, particularly the T part of that. And so this, uh, um, this refrain has been something that I've been singing for the last three years, and uh, I appreciate the willingness to take it back. I'm just hoping that when you uh, raise this issue again, uh, if you just point out that this is, this is the same question that I've been asking since 2020, and that is how, how have we or are we developing anything that speaks, we, we talk about things in general, but there, uh, there are sub-communities uh, in, in certain demographic uh, arenas that are just not being helped at all because we've not developed any uh, significant outreach uh, program to number one, mm -hmm. identify what the issues are. Number two, find people who are already in those communities uh, trying to help uh, work on those challenges. And number three, making sure that um, uh, programmatically from a DHHS perspective, um, that information is trickling down. So it, it's a concern that I've had since 20 and it's one that continues. So appreciate your willingness to take it back. And I'm just hoping that we'll be able to come up with um, some type of an answer uh, that addresses the addresses the challenges that are still being felt by the communities. If we don't address, address the issues that have been, been present since 2020, uh, the ARPA money that's coming in uh, will will be woefully short of where the needs are in those communities because because we'll continue to do a one over uh, one over the world approach and people in those communities uh, don't have this the same level of trust uh, in the healthcare system as um, some uh, in other communities. So thank you, thank you for your indulgence, Madam Chair. Thank you, Vice Chair Spearman. Um, are we? Do we have any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, I'm going to um, quick ask a question about the Autism Treatment Assistance Program. You'd mentioned that there was a wait list, but that um, it has been decreasing. So I wanted to find out how many are on the wait list, what you're doing to decrease that wait list, and also what happens to a person after age 20? Um, where do they go for services? Thank you for your question, Madam Chair. This is Ricky Rao for the record. Um, I'm excited to say when I came into this position about four and a half years ago, we had close to 900 children on the Autism Treatment Assistance um, Program wait list. And we just had about 25 children on that list, wait list this week. So um, we're now serving over 900 children versus having 900 children on the wait list. Uh, we've been doing multiple things. We did have um, an audit from the um, 19 uh, legislative session. And that's also um, helped us to, I'm sorry, from the 21 legislative session, um, that's helped us to really reach out. We had a, a full analysis uh, through that audit and it's helped us with um, working with Medicaid and other community uh, providers to get the word out. Um, we also received a rate increase um, for registered uh, behavioral technicians from $31.30 to $52.04 per hour to ensure that we are providing that um, applied behavioral analysis therapy to those individuals. So that's also helped us increase in our provider capacity. Uh, we really were challenged with that provider capacity based on that rate. And so we have seen that we have increased our provider capacity for uh, ABA services and supports. And so we do believe that that has had a significant impact to our wait list. Um, Obviously, it's something we will continue to work through, but we have been affected by the critical staffing shortages as well. So we're excited to say that we have approximately 20 children on our current wait list. 
Um, but we're still working through hiring appropriate developmental specialists to provide those services, as well as the providers to ensure that we can remain having a low wait list um, for the autism treatment assistance program. Hopefully that answered your question, sorry. Yes, it did, thanks. I just had the other part of the question of what happens to the children at 20 when they move into adulthood, um, where do they go? Uh, Ricky Rob, for the record, so there's multiple uh, pieces to that, and uh, some of those children are duly eligible for an ATAP uh, service, but they also would be eligible for developmental services. So we do work closely as an agency to ensure that we provide those supports. So as they age into adulthood, they have additional supports as well. But I'll turn that over to Jessica um, Adams to explain how developmental services provides those supports. Jessica Adams for the record. So as Ricky said, some of the individuals that are served by ATAP are also going to qualify for one of the regional centers. Um, for those that do qualify, then they typically are gonna go into one of our um, programs that I was talking about, like supported living arrangements, jobs and day training. Um, we're going to keep providing services to that person and supports to that person for the rest of their, of their life. Um, Unfortunately, though, for, for those ind individuals who do not reach the level of care needs for regional centers, um, I'll be honest, there is not a whole lot of service for it for people with autism after the age of 20 in the state that do not qualify for a regional center. Thank you very much for that. Okay, seeing no other questions, our next order of business, we'll hear from additional representatives from the Aging and Disability Services Division of the Department of Health and Human Services, and they'll provide an overview of the home and community-based services programs available to individuals with functional limitations in Nevada. We'll take questions from members at the end of the presentation, so feel free to start your presentation. Thank you. Good morning. For the record, Jennifer Frischman. I serve as the Quality Assurance Manager for Aging and Disability Services, and with me today on my, le on my left, I have Crystal Wren, the Chief of Community-Based Care, which you just heard a little bit about, and on my right, I have Megan Wickland. She serves as the Developmental Services QA Manager, and so we'll just jump right into our presentation, if that's all right. Yes, please proceed. And let us know when it shows, because it's showing on our end, but I don't see it on, there we go. Good? Excellent. Yes, we can see it on our end. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So our agenda today is basically going to be just a brief overview of home and community-based services. And I'd like to clarify that the home and community-based services that we are talking about are not the same home and community-based services that you just heard in the previous presentation with the PAC unit. These are focusing on Medicaid, home and community-based services, and home and community-based waivers. So what are home and community-based services? I don't think I need to remind anyone on this committee that studies have shown that people have better health outcomes when services are provided in their own home or residence within the communities that they are familiar with. So home and community-based services provides opportunities for those individuals to remain in their home and we wrap services around them rather than have them institutionalized or in other isolated settings. Programs can serve targeted populations. Um, we'll be talking specifically today with about people with intellectual or developmental disabilities, those with physical disabilities, and the frail elderly. It should be noted that home and community-based services, or I'll be referring to it as HCBS, are gen generally non-medical services. So these are services that traditional commercial insurance companies typically don't cover. And then also, HCBS are person-centered and tailored to the individual receiving the service. You heard Jessica Adams talk earlier that um, the role of the service coordinator and, and the social health assessment, so that's how we base these services. When we talk about HCBS waivers, um, that started back um, around 1981, and it had institutional bias. So those individuals that needed supports and that were receiving supports in skilled nursing facilities or other institutions, um, they could only get those supports in those settings. And when they wanted to return to the community, Medicaid 
did not cover any of those services that were needed. So basically with the um, Americans with Disabilities Act and the Olmstead decision, there are changes to the 1915C part of the Social Security Act and it allowed states to ask for waivers to their Medicaid services. And so what can be waived? Basically when we say a waiver, you can waive statewideness. And yes, that is actually a word, but it allows states to choose and target um, areas of the greatest need. So if you only had a provider in Southern Nevada in Las Vegas, you could have a waiver that only served those folks down in Las Vegas. You have also comparability of services. So when someone is on Medicaid, it does not matter where they reside. They could be in Elko, they could be in Pahrump, they could be in Washoe. Everyone receiving state plan Medicaid services receive the same services. The waivers allow states to target certain populations. So for example, states can use this authority to target services to the, to the elderly, technology dependent children, people with behavioral conditions, or people with intellectual disabilities. Waivers also allow us to waive income and resource rules that apply in the community. And it lets states provide Medicaid to people who would otherwise be eligible only in an institutional setting, often due to the income and resources of a spouse or parent. Again, this is just a brief introduction to the HCBS waivers. I just want to make a point that all individuals on the waiver also receive full Medicaid benefits. So they get the whole array of state plan Medicaid services as well as other additional waiver services. The waivers work in conjunction with state plan Medicaid. A good example of that is personal care services. So in Nevada, personal care services are part of of the Medicaid state plan, and they can be authorized up to 36 hours a week. However, if the service coordinator or the social worker feels that the individual needs additional um, care, maybe they had a recent hospitalization, a surgery, getting over an illness, something like that, the social worker is authorized to provide attendant care services. And Ms. Wren will get into that in just a little bit. And it's also important to point out that the Division of Healthcare Financing and Policy is the administrating, administering agency and ADSD is the operating agency for these waivers. So the actual waiver is signed off on by the Division of Healthcare Financing and Policy. It's basically their contract with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and they administer the program and we operate it. So we provide the, the service coordinators and the social workers to provide those services. Waivers are intended to give states flexibility um, to serve new populations and provide services in innovative ways. As I just said, the state cannot pay for the same services as state plan, but they can help su supplement Medicaid state plan services. Waivers can't pay for anything that would be duplicative from any other federal funding source, since, such as IDEA or the 4E programs. And we cannot pay for any service to individuals residing in an institution. So that could be a nursing home, a hospital, a jail, intermediate care facility, et cetera. And then also waivers need to be cost neutral. So the total annual cost of the waiver program cannot exceed the total cost of those individuals if they were institutionalized. Back in about 2014, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services released what at that time was called the new rule for home and community-based settings. And while it's several years later, uh, the new rule goes into effect in March of 2023. Some key provisions of that, um, the biggest one is those that are receiving services through HCBS waivers must have full integration within their community just as those that do not receive services through HCBS. So the services, the settings must be selected from, by the individual for multiple options, ensure the individual's rights to privacy, dignity, and respect, optimize individual initiative and autonomy, facilitate individual choice, ensure the individual receives services in the community to the same degree of access as individuals not receiving Medicaid home and community-based services. And then another big provision of this rule is that uh, for folks that are residing in congregate settings, 
They need to ensure that a lease, residency agreement, or other form of written agreement will be in place for each participant and that the document provides protections that address eviction processes and appeals comparable the to those provided under the jurisdiction's landlord-tenant laws. So anything that, um, for eviction purposes, the person receiving waiver services has to have the same rights as an individual not receiving HCBS services living in that setting. This next slide is a very, very high-level overview of the waiver intake and approval process. On your right-hand side, you'll see Aging and Disability Services, ADSD, that's the, the first touch point for someone who wants to be, um, become waiver eligible. The social worker, the service coordinator does the intake process, makes sure that the individual meets the waiver criteria. That application is then sent to the Division of Welfare and Supportive Services, and they actually do the financial eligibility to make sure that the person is eligible. And then to close that loop is the Division of Healthcare Financing and Policy. So once it gets through aging and the welfare division, it goes to Nevada Medicaid for final approval as they are the administering agency. Administering agency. Financial eligibility, this again is a very, very high level overview. Each case is different, um, so when in doubt, have someone apply for the waiver and the Division of Welfare Services um, will complete the final financial eligibility. But in a nutshell, individuals must be at or below 300% of the Social Security SSI federal benefit rate for their household size. They cannot have more than $2,000 in resources, must be a resident of the United States, and must be a United States, I'm sorry, resident of the state of Nevada, and must be a United States citizen or lawful permanent resident. So what waivers do we offer here in Nevada? Um, it's a running joke and they've said, when you've seen one waiver program in one state, you've seen one waiver program in one state. So each state has different waivers. Some have waivers that target brain injuries, HIV AIDS, technology dependent children. Here in Nevada, we have three waivers. We have our frail elderly waiver, as Jessica mentioned before, that serves individuals age 65 or older that meet a nursing facility level of care. We have our physically disabled waiver that serves individuals of all ages who have a documented physical disability that meet a nursing facility level of care. And then we have our intellectual developmental disability or IDD waiver that serves individuals of all ages who have documented intellectual or developmental disability. And at this time, I will turn it over to Ms. Crystal Wren and she will go further into depth on the frail elderly and physically disabled waivers. Hi, good morning and thank you for having me. My name is Crystal Wren and I am the Social Services Chief for Community-Based Care and I oversee the operations for the HCBS waivers for the frail elderly and persons with physical disabilities. I'm gonna talk about the intake process. Jennifer gave you a high-level overview. I'm gonna go a little deeper just to um, demonstrate what the social workers do for an applicant for um, either the frail elderly or the physically disabled waiver. When someone is interested in one of these waivers, they will submit a community-based care or CBC program application to their local ADSD office. Once received, the intake specialist will telephone the applicant to verify the information and schedule an in-person assessment. The in-person assessment includes a level of care screening to ensure the applicant meets the criteria for the waiver. And if a waiver slot is available, the intake specialist will also complete the financial application and send that with supporting documentation to the welfare office for processing. If a waiver slot is not available, the intake specialist will request that that individual be placed on the wait list according to their priority level. And then once approved, the intake specialist will assign this case to an ongoing case manager where services may begin. So the ongoing case manager will um, determine the service need um, based on the assessment completed and based on the needs of the individual. Uh, once approved for the waiver, um, they will schedule another in-person assessment to complete a social health assessment, which will include an evaluation of the individual's service needs and goals. The as assessment includes an overview of the activities of daily living, I'm gonna to refer to that as ADL, and instrumental activities of daily living, which is IADL. So ADLs include bathing, dressing, grooming, toilet,
toileting, eating, mobility, and transfers. IADLs, the instrumental piece, is the meal preparation, homemaker, laundry, and shopping for an individual. Once this, uh, the needs have been determined, a person-centered plan is developed with the individual at the center of the plan. They are part of that piece throughout the development. It's their plan and we want to make sure that they have a say. The plan lays out the individual's needs, the goals, and any referrals needed to support them in the community and allow them to stay in their home. The case manager will provide the individual with a, with a list of Medicaid approved providers based on the service that they need. Um, for example, uh, if they need homemaker, we will pull up a list of um, approved homemaker providers and provide that to the individual and they can contact the providers and do kind of an interview to make sure that that provider suits their needs and their interests. And if needed, we are there to assist as well. Um, we do not choose a provider on their behalf. It is person-centered and we want to make sure again that they have that voice. Once a provider is selected, the case manager will request an authorization and services can start for that individual. So the services offered under the Frail Elderly and Physically Disabled Waiver are, um, are very home-based in nature. Um, there's an array of home selections such as case, uh, chore, homemaker, uh, attendant care, as uh, Jennifer mentioned, and there's also some community-focused programs and some residential settings, and I will define these more in the following slides. So case management is offered to everyone on the frail elderly or physically disabled waiver. This service helps to support individuals through authorizations, resource referrals, uh, connections within the community, and um, acts as a, as a second voice if needed through, um, through the process. CHOR is authorized as a one-time service intended to support a task that is outside the scope of the personal care service approved authorizations. Examples of chore include carpet cleaning, uh, shampooing, maybe that deep clean needed, uh, removal of debris and clutter to keep an um, individual safe in their home, um, such as a, a hoarding issue, for example. That's something that we can authorize a company to come in and help remove that debris so there is no fall risk. Adult Companion is a service intended to provide oversight and socialization for an individual in their own home. Respite is authorized as a relief for the primary caregiver, and it does include ADL and IADL care. And then the Personal Emergency Response System, we call it PERS, but it is not the retirement system. <laughs> this is the, um, the button device that a lot of folks will wear. They can wear it as like a lanyard, a necklace. There are some wrist devices and some devices that are um, on their nightstand. It, it is a device that can detect falls. Um, they can be pushed in, in case of an emergency and it alerts the company to send um, emergency medical crews or um, police if needed. So the following um, services are available only to those on the physically disabled waiver, and this includes attendant care, home delivered meals, specialized medical equipment, and environmental accessibility adaptations. So attendant care, as Jennifer mentioned earlier, is an extension of our state plan personal care services. Um, she gave a very good example of when we would authorize additional services. If they have exhausted what state plan can offer, um, the licensed uh, caregiver, or case manager can go in and authorize additional services um, as they see fit to keep that person safe in their home. Home delivered meals are authorized for those who have a, tr a nutritional risk and are delivered to the individual's home. Um, they're often delivered in bulk, uh, such as a, a 30 meals at a time, 15 meals at a time, depending on what the individual requests. And it does allow the individual to work with that provider to um, to ensure that their nutritional needs are met, such as a, a diabetic menu, maybe they need low salt, a lot of different options. Um, and they do have like vegetarian options and uh, different, different ways of supporting that person's preference. Specialized medical equipment, this service isn't used as frequently as it used to be, and I'm happy to say that um, Medicare has actually increased the um, amount of devices that are covered by Medicaid. So this only comes in when we have a device that is not covered. Then um, specialized medical equipment can be used to pay for something for an individual um, to be safe in their home. 
And environmental adaptations, uh, this service is for those um, who are in need of a modification to their home, their residence, um, or, or perhaps the place they rent to allow them to stay, stay safe in their home. Uh, common adaptations are, are ramps for, for wheelchairs or to eliminate the stairs. We've done doorway widenings. Um, we've done roll-in showers, uh, even thresholds, grab bars, uh, you name it, they, they will um, authorize it. Uh, this last set of services is going to be those that are offered in the community or a congregate setting. Um, so augmented personal care is the name that is associated with group home um, coverage. So augmented personal care and assisted living are relatively the same service. It just depends on the provider and how they enroll with Medicaid. So both services offer 24-hour in-home service for individuals who are not appropriate to reside in their private residence and who still meet the qualifications for a waiver. So reimbursement for these services include the IADL and ADL care. However, room and board is not allowed to be reimbursed through Medicaid. That is a private agreement that's arranged between the individual or their representative and the agency. Adult daycare is offered in a congregate setting and includes interactions with the individual and their peers, allowing for socialization and oversight as needed. Uh, many loved ones use adult daycare as a respite option. Instead of having someone come to their home, it affords them the opportunity to um, be around other um, individuals there, there, uh, within their age and just give them that, that socialization that all of us need. And a benefit for adult daycare is that many of our providers are also an adult day health care provider. And so as folks within that daycare setting um, graduate to that next need, they don't have to transition to a new setting. They're able to stay within that location that they're comfortable with and still retain that same amount of care that they're, um, that they're needing. So for the waiver participants on the wait list, in, um, as of January of uh, 2022, we had um, 2,648 individuals on the frail elderly waiver and 235 individuals on our wait list. And for the physically disabled waiver, um, as of January of 2022, we had 1,124 individuals on the waiver and 84 on the wait list. So now I'll turn it over to Megan Wickland to talk about Nevada's other waiver option. Hello, I am Megan Wickland. I am the Developmental Services Quality Assurance Manager. Thank you for your time today. I will uh, provide an overview for you of our Intellectual and Developmental Disability Waiver. So in order to be eligible for our waiver, a person has to first be eligible for Developmental Services. So an individual just needs to apply at the regional center uh, where they live. An intake specialist will then meet with them to gather supporting documentation to determine if they have a qualifying diagnosis. And if more information is needed, then uh, the regional center can conduct um, psychological testing and assessment to help inform eligibility. And once found eligible, a case is opened and then assigned to a service coordinator. Um, and just one of the key components um, to what we do is person-centered planning, so you've heard that mentioned previously. Um, and that's a process that really identifies the person's strengths, their needs, their preferences, their desired outcomes that help um, support them to have positive control over the life that they choose and find satisfying. And it's that person-centered plan that really drives the supports and services that they receive and would outline the waiver services that I'm going to go over for you. We have 11 waiver services um, that we contract with community providers to deliver that service, as Jessica Adams had previously mentioned. And so I'm gonna go through each one of these for you today. We have four types of jobs and day training uh, services. The first one is our day habilitation. And this service provides meaningful activities to people in the community that helps foster uh, the acquisition, retention, or uh, improvement of skills, such as daily living skills and socialization skills. Uh, this can also include retirement activities for people who no longer want to work. Um, and these services are not vocational in nature. Our pre-vocational services, on the other hand, provide work experience, including 
uh, volunteer work. Uh, it teaches general employment related skills such as the ability to communicate with uh, their supervisor, coworkers, customers. Um, uh, it can include workplace conduct and dress, following directions, those types of things. Then we have supported employment and that has two categories. The first is individual um, and that is for recipients that need more one-on-one uh, -on -one, um, ongoing intensive support to either obtain um, and maintain a job. So that could include job coaching to help focus on a specific task. Um, and then we have group supported employment. Uh, that provides training and work experience in a regular business, industry, or community setting. Um, that supports groups of two to eight uh, workers with disabilities. And so an example of that would be our mobile work crews where people uh, work either in janitorial work or do landscaping. And then we have our career planning. This is a comprehensive employment planning and support service that helps people to identify an employment goal and a plan to achieving that goal. Um, so that could include job exploration um, or job shadowing. Then we have our supported living arrangement services and this includes residential support services and residential support management. And these services are provided on a continuum uh, from intermittent where a person would receive um, services um, in their home, their own home, their own apartment, or if they're living in their family home, where a provider comes in for a designated number of hours each week or month based on the person's needs. We also have uh, shared living services where one or two people uh, live with a family or a couple and share life experiences where natural supports are built in. And then we have our 24-hour supported living arrangement services that supports up to four people uh, living in a home together with staff available 24-7. These services are designed to ensure the health and welfare of the person through uh, direct services and protective oversight um, that assist the person to learn, improve, uh, retain or maintain skills needed to be as independent as possible um, in the community. Um, and then we have our residential support managers that assist the person with basically managing their residential supports. They do a variety of tasks, including developing plans, training staff on uh, implementing those plans as they work with the individuals. Um, they also help apply for uh, resources and benefits in the community. Our next waiver service is our behavioral consultation training and intervention. Um, and this is designed to increase uh, positive alternative behaviors and decrease um, and address challenging behaviors uh, through behaviorally based uh, assessment and intervention. It's a well-rounded approach to serving uh, the person and their team through that training and consultation component. Our next service is our counseling services. Uh, this provides problem identification and resolution in areas of interpersonal relationships, independence, community participation. It can be done via individual or group counseling um, and is provided by licensed professionals um, in psychology, counseling, or other related fields. Our nursing services has uh, three components. Uh, the first is medical management that is performed by either a licensed registered nurse or a licensed practical nurse. And it's geared towards the development of health services support plans, observation and assessment. They do training uh, to the direct support staff or family members to help carry out uh, treatment plans. And uh, they also provide monitoring and assessment of the recipients um, health condition. And then we have nursing assessment that is done by a licensed registered nurse only that identifies the person's uh, needs and abilities. That assessment information is then uh, provided, it provides recommendations for medical and mental health care follow-up and that information is then shared with the person's team and for review and is included in that person-centered plan. Uh, and then we have our direct services that can be performed by either a licensed registered nurse or licensed practical nurse. Uh, these are direct skilled nursing services uh, that are intended to allow uh, the 
person to live safely within the community um, and the services can be provided at home or in the work uh, setting as uh, determined by their person-centered plan. We also have non-medical transportation that supports people in accessing services, activities, and resources in the community. Um, and these can include bus passes. And then our last waiver service is our nutrition counseling service. Um, and this is provided by a registered dietitian to support the health and nutritional needs of recipients through assessment, nutritional plan development, um, training and education of the person and those working with them. And as of January 2022, we currently have 2,582 individuals on the waiver. Um, and we have 412 individuals who are on our waiver wait list statewide. So that concludes our presentation. Do you have any questions for us? Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, committee members, any questions? Assemblywoman Considine. Thank you. I had a question on the waiver wait lists. Do, what are the options for the folks on the wait list? Do they need to remain in an institution? Do, are there any other services available to them or they're just waiting until they're called? This is Jennifer Frischman for the record. So there's two answers to that. I'll refer to the frail elderly and physically disabled waivers first. Unfortunately, as, as Crystal said, we have two state-run programs, our PAS program and our COPE pro program that can bridge the gap um, for those waiting for services to waiting to get on the waiver. But those are the only two programs that we have. They do not have to reside in an institution if they are not currently in an institution, so that's not a requirement. For our uh, individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities waiver, they can be receiving state plan services. So we have all of the services that uh, Ms. Wickland mentioned, those 11 waiver, waiver services. We also fund those with state general fund for those that are waiting for a waiver slot or maybe only need a small amount of services so we wouldn't take up a, a wait list spot or a waiver slot for them. Thank you. Can I ask a different question? Absolutely. Go ahead. On the, the phone, the personal emergency response system, um, I don't know if those are attached to folks' home phones or if there are their cell phones, but I know there's been an issue recently about 3G and just wanted to know if all of these have been confirmed to be above 3G so it's not a situation where somebody presses the button and it doesn't work anymore. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Crystal Wren, for the record. I have not been notified by any of my uh, case managers that they have had issues. Um, I will follow up with our providers to ensure that they have been updated to the, the current 5G. Um, I know our providers are, are very good at staying up to date on technology, and they are oftentimes ahead of technology that we've actually been aware of in Nevada. So I will definitely follow up on that. Thank you. Any other questions? None on Zoom? Okay. Thank you very much again for your presentation. So our next presentation um, will be from Jeff Duncan and Cheyenne Pascal, Unit Chief and Planning Chief, respectively, with the Aging and Disability Services Division of the Department of Health and Human Services regarding senior citizen demographics in Nevada. Again, we'll take questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Mr. Duncan, please proceed when you're ready. With you. Good. Thank you, uh, Chair Gorlo and members of the committee. Uh, we appreciate the uh, opportunity to present to you today on our uh, Nevada Elders Count Report. Um, my name is Jeff Duncan. I'm a unit chief. I'm here for the division, and I'll be co-presenting with Ms. Pasquale sitting to my left. So now that you've heard about um, many of our programs, we now want to talk to you or walk you through, excuse me, the who and why we serve. So our agenda today includes a brief overview of our Elders Count report, and then we'll highlight key sections of the report listed there. Um, we've also included a resource slide, and uh, we'll answer any questions for you all at the end. So before I give you the brief overview, 
um, of the 2021 report, we want to thank um, many who served on our collaboration team. So we work closely with the uh, Center for Healthy Aging, our uh, office, of, office of statewide initiatives at the University of Nevada, Reno, School of Medicine. Uh, of course, individuals from our division were a part of the team. Um, we also worked with uh, very closely with our Office of Data Analytics under our department, uh, individuals at Public and Behavioral Health, our state demographer, and our Medicaid division. So this report will provide you um, data highlights. Now, I want to mention it's just a snapshot. Um, we did not go into the full detail of the report today um, about our older adult population, and we broke it down for uh, uh, six key sections. And this is population, economics, health status, health risk and behaviors, health care, and then infrastructure. But in total, there are 63 charts um, in the report. Um, and of course, we're not going to be able to highlight all of those for you today, but you will get a uh, link to the report. So this report not only helps um, our agency with planning and program development, but also improves the awareness of the unique needs and challenges of, of Nevada's older adult population um, that they face. And it also should help give our uh, legislature, uh, state entities, and the uh, community as a whole a snapshot of uh, Nevada older adults. Uh, we'd like to note that we are currently planning for our 2023 Elders Count Report. Uh, it's currently underway and uh, will be published uh, this fall. Um, in addition to the sections uh, already listed in the 2021 report, we, uh, we will be including new sections in the 2023 report um, on adults with uh, disabilities and a section on dementia. So with that, now we'll start to walk you through some of the, the highlights. Um, I'm glad we're going before lunch because some people think beta data is boring. We do not think it's boring. So we hope that we wow you with our, uh, or our data selections here. So on this slide, we wanna highlight um, that between 20, excuse me, 2011 and 2018, the overall Nevada population increased by a little over 11%. During the same time frame, individuals 65 and older increased by 40%, and individuals 85 and older increased by 25%. Um, in addition, uh, the 55 and older population, which is aging into the Medicare population, increased by 28%. On our growth slide, um, we would like to point out that Nevada's growth rate for um, individuals 85 and older is nearly double the national rate. In fact, Nevada's population is expected to continue to age at higher rates through 2030. On our migration, our migration slide, we want to point out that um, uh, Nevada by older adults continues to rise, especially in Southern Nevada. Uh, you might, all, might, might also find it interesting that the um, largest older adult group migrating to rural counties or communities, excuse me, is in this 55 to 64 age range. And our uh, numbers indicate that a larger percentage of older adults in those communities to rise in the next five to 10 years. So on this slide, it demonstrates our age group distribution in five-year cohorts. Um, while we ex are experiencing a swelling of older adult population growth now because of the baby boomer generation, there is also predicted to be another swell um, in the 25 to 34 age range. On this slide, you can see Nevada's overall population is more diverse than nationally. Nevada has a higher proportion in minorities in all categories except for Black and African American, and populations such as Hispanics and Asians are significantly higher than the national average. The last slide that I will cover is our living alone slide. So in Nevada, 14.3% um, of the people who live alone are 65 and older. Of that, over 53% um, are females compared to 30% for the males. Uh, there are slight differences uh, from the national averages with Nevada males trending higher and Nevada females trending lower. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Pasquale who will walk you through the remaining slides. Good afternoon, Cheyenne Pasquale for the record. Um, we are gonna move into the economics section. Um, on slide 12, um, 
This slide just shows the percentage of households with people age 65 and older living in poverty. Um, overall, uh, um, Nevada's population is 9.6% of the people age 65 and older are living in poverty. Um, you can see in the rural areas that percentage jumps up to 10.4%. Additionally, um, we will likely see our, our percentage of Nevada popu population age 65 and older increase um, because not pictured on this slide is the fact that 11.8% of the population 45 to 64 um, are currently falling under the poverty threshold. On slide 13, this slide shows a comparison by US region of expenditures. Um, in the West region, which includes Nevada, it's not surprising housing is the largest and we expect um, that we might see that grow. On slide 14, this slide shows the rate of homelessness or those on the verge of homelessness when entering programs. Um, again, with the 2023 update, um, we suspect these rates will increase um, given the current housing crisis that Nevada is facing. Next, we'll talk about health status and health risks and behaviors. On slide 16, um, according to the National Center for Health Statistics, heart disease has been the leading cause of death in the US for decades followed by cancer. This remains true in Nevada with the percentage of deaths related to heart disease and cancer slightly higher in Nevada than the US averages. Um, one thing to note that um, COVID um, has skewed this data and um, it, COVID is uh, now, I believe in the top uh, three causes of death for older adults. Slide 17. Um, this slide shows the rate of adults age 65 and older accessing mental health treatment. Um, you can see that this number is significantly lower um, than the age 55 to 65 age group. Um, however, um, Nevada's rate of suicide among older adults is significantly higher than the U.S. rate. On slide 18, this um, slide shows the rate of falls um, increased dramatically as people age, doubling between the age group of 75 to 84 and the 85 and older age group. Um, falls are particularly dangerous after an acute care hospital stay and contribute to um, increased 30-day hospital readmissions among Nevada's older adults. On slide 19, the Nevada drug overdose related um, inpatient admissions. While the overall, the rates of drug overdose related to inpatient admissions for Nevadans age 55 and older is relatively small. There's, a, there's an alarming increase in the rate per 100,000 people age 55 and older. Um, Additionally, the rate of hospitalizations is 58% higher for the older age group and correlates with the increased rate of falls for this age group. On slide 19, um, this slide shows the substantiated cases um, and the <clears throat> case types. It's interesting to note that um, we reported um, the highest type of uh, the the most reported case type is self-neglect, um, but the highest substantiated case type is abuse. So um, uh, we're next gonna uh, jump into healthcare. And on slide 22, um, this slide shows the age dis distribution of Medicaid and CHIP enrollees. You can see age 65 and older is seven, approximately 7% of the pop, uh, Medicaid population, um, but this is the larger share of dual eligible population, which um, accounts for approximately 32% of Medicaid spending. This next slide just uh, shows healthcare expenditures by type. Um, Nevada is um, pretty comparable to the US with hospital care being the largest expenditure. 
The value of, on slide 24, the value of community-based services in, in both terms of expenditures and quality of life is undeniable. Although long-term care facilities are still a critical part of the healthcare infrastructure for many older adults. In-home services are nearly half the average cost per year than a skilled nursing facility. In terms of um, nursing facilities, nursing homes in Nevada have outpaced the U.S. in severe, severe deficiencies and substandard quality of care since 2011. This table demonstrates the need for extensive review of nursing home regulations to improve care for residents, um, which have been amplified by the COVID-19 pandemic. Next, we're gonna move into infrastructure. On slide 27, um, Nevada is experiencing a shortage of primary care physicians as compared to the US um, with our rate um, of physicians as low as 107.4 um, per 100,000. On slide um, 20, uh, this is a chart that shows the comparison of um, rates per 100 older adults of, um, it's the workforce, I'm sorry. The workforce um, grew by 18.5% and the population grew by 21.8%. So our workforce is not um, growing at the same rate as our population is, um, which can indicate a shortage. And with that, um, we have a few additional resources uh, for your reading pleasure, and we will take any questions. <laughs> Thank you very much for that overview. Um, committee, are there any questions? Anybody on virtually? Senator Spearman. Uh, hi, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. And um, it was a stark reminder of a, um, a stark reminder of a briefing that we received. I think it was back in the uh, 2013, 2014-15 uh, interim regarding the graying of Nevada. So here's my question. Uh, we know that we don't have enough um, primary caregivers uh, for the general population, and it is exacerbated when you start looking, breaking it down demographically for those who are 50 and over. Um, have we looked at any way uh, that we might be able to mitigate the impact uh, that the lack of the number of physicians, necessary number of physicians is available for our seniors? And number two, again, I have to ask the question, have we looked at what that looks like uh, as we look at it from um, the various demographic categories, uh, not just BIPOC, but um, uh, affectional orientation, uh, differences in family structures or lack thereof. Seniors who are uh, in their 60s or 70s did not have the same luxury uh, as those who are coming up with respect to being able to adopt children and to have an extended family. So um, have we looked at what the needs maybe right now and what they could be because Nevada is is graying and that graying will take place across all demographic structures. Uh, what what is it that we need to be doing now um, as legislators or as policymakers so that we can uh, reduce or mitigate the impact of some of the negative impacts that come along with uh, the lack of resources? So this is Jeff Duncan for the record. Thank you for your question, Senator Spearman. So I'll, I'll answer it this way. I know I've seen you on interim committees and watched the legislature over the years. I've also uh, witnessed our advisory bodies that really tried to advocate to bring additional physicians to the state. I can't say that our agency has a, a lead role in that, but we definitely like to be at the table to, to provide the information about um, the populations we serve. So I can't speak to anything specifically on our, that we're taking the lead on other than we work closely with the the interim committees, such as this one, our legislature, and then our advisory bodies. Um, follow up, Madam Chair. Uh, this is probably more of a comment yeah. than a question. Um, I know that <clears throat> uh, for the last several section, sessions, we've been trying to look at things with respect to making sure that um, uh, professional boards are doing the right thing when people uh, apply for licensure. And perhaps there's something that um, you all might be able to do to help us uh, ensure that licensing procedures are 
uh, properly uh, conducted and for those who um, have a right to get a license in the state of Nevada, make sure that those are done as expeditiously and safely as possible. So maybe there, maybe there is uh, some type of intersectionality in terms of what you need uh, in order to provide the services that you need for seniors and then some things that we as policymakers might be able uh, to do in the upcoming session. Just a thought. Thank you, Vice Chair Spearman. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Okay, please, Assemblyman MacArthur. Thank you. I don't know where it was. It's on one of the slides. Um, you referred to poverty, poverty threshold. What is that threshold? Cheyenne Pasquale, for the record, um, I do not have that number off the top of my head, um, but let me see if I can pull it up. I do not have that number um, readily available, but I can follow up with that. Okay. Thank you, Assemblyman MacArthur. Are there any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, um, I do have a concern. It's on slide 25, the nursing home deficiencies. Um, I have to say I'm quite alarmed at the number of severe deficiencies and substandard quality of care numbers in Nevada. Uh, do you have any specific information on what those deficiencies are and what harm or immediate jeopardy was caused by those deficiencies? So this is Jeff Dunker for the record. Perhaps I could phone a friend sitting in the back of the room if Ms. Williams Woods would mind stepping to the table. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being the phone a friend. <laughs> we're, we're a team, we collaborate. Um, my name is Jennifer Williams with State Long Term Care Ombudsman, for the record. Um, the deficiencies are actually issued by the Bureau of Healthcare Quality and Compliance. And while the Ombudsman advocates for individuals in long term care settings, we don't have exact um, authority to. Um, regulate or enforce those um, deficient, you know, impose those deficiencies. However, as um, Ms. Carrie Embry mentioned earlier in her presentation, we do have trends that we see um, in long-term care. And um, so those would be the types of issues that we look at. As she mentioned previously, discharge um, issues, transfers, um, uh, exploitation, physical and verbal abuse are some of the top concerns that we have and we collaborate with Adult Protective Services as well to assist in those um, situations with our residents in long-term care. So I don't have specific information regarding those deficiencies. Um, perhaps um, the Bureau of Healthcare Quality and Compliance could provide some additional information at a future um, interim uh, committee meeting. Thank you very much for that. Um... Yes, I think that would be a good idea to have them come and talk a little bit more about that and see what we might be able to look at to um, decrease some of those severe deficiencies and substandard quality of care. So last call for questions with our committee. Any others? Seeing none, thank you again. I actually do find data very interesting, so I appreciate your presentation. <laughs> So at this point, uh, we will have a presentation by representatives of the Aging and Disability Services Division of the Department of Health and Human Services of the State Long-Term Care Ombudsman regarding the status of COVID-19 for senior citizens, adults with disabilities, and those in long-term care facilities. Again, we will take questions at the conclusion of the presentation. You may begin when ready.
Good afternoon. And for the record, my name is Tammy Seaver. I'm the Social Services Chief for Adult Protective Services. And on behalf of myself and my co-presenters, Joanne Caver, who is the Clinical Program Manager with Desert Regional Center, and as you previously met, Jennifer Williams-Woods, our long-term care ombudsman, um, we appreciate this opportunity to discuss the um, service impacts that COVID-19 had on Nevada older adult and people with disabilities in Nevada. Next slide. Um, during this presentation, we will discuss how COVID-19 impacted ADSD programs, our clients and providers, and how ADSD provide, responded to the pandemic. We will also share with you some brief COVID data and funding opportunities became available over the last couple of years. I will now turn over the presentation to Joan Caver, who will discuss the impacts to the service delivery. Tammy, good afternoon. My name is Joan Caver. I am the clinical program manager, ADSD, for the record. I'm going to discuss the impact that COVID-19 has had on the individuals we support, our programs and staff that work within our programs. Uh, some of the information you hear about each will be similar as I summarize each slide. The majority of this information focuses on the initial impact of COVID-19 to all three. The individual impact um, increased isolation. Uh, our service providers such as personal care attendants, adult, adult companions, homemakers and chore were limited or didn't support people in their own home. Community congregate sites such as senior, senior, sitters, senior centers, adult daycare, jobs and daycare programs were initially unavailable for people to attend. Family members and or natural supports in some cases were afraid and or sick themselves and didn't visit people who lived in their own homes. And you know what? Um, the impact in terms of those that were in congregate settings or long-term care um, environments. People residing in this, these environments experience isolation due to our staff and family members or other natural supports being unable to visit them or having less frequency of visits during the initial stages of COVID-19. Also social interactions for people living in these environments were affected primarily due to social distancing rules and COVID-19 guidelines. In terms of their, the individual impact of their health and welfare, people who needed care beyond what they traditionally received in their homes or congregate environment experienced delays and admissions uh, from cares from hospitals, uh, routine preventative care. Uh, telehealth was difficult for some. Uh, people who were in facilities did not receive the same protective oversight measures, um, such as their rights uh, weren't properly, maybe not have been properly assessed. Uh, visitation from case managers, family members, were also decreased and or didn't occur as uh, typically scheduled prior to the pandemic. Next slide. With regards to our program impact, um, our offices were closed abruptly, which didn't allow our staff the proper transition time to move from a working in office environment to in many cases working um, at home. Um, we, ex we saw a staff who were used to working in face-to-face uh, environments with clients move to a virtual environment using virtual technology or and or telephones. Um, because staff began working from home, this required our IT department to quickly ensure staff had the proper IT equipment, uh, remote devices, which also put a strain on our IT department. Staff's impact, um, as I indicated uh, previously, we went from a face-to-face -face primarily delivery system to a virtual phone delivery system. 
Meetings that typically had occurred in person became virtual phone meetings. Um, coordination of services for people became challenging for staff due to the lack of providers. In other words, providers that we were used to working with who could support people were limited with their staffing issues themselves. Our intermediate care facility, which was discuss, discussed earlier, had some of the same similar issues as some of the long-term care and congregate environment in terms of the effects on the individuals living in the ICF. The individuals experienced isolation from outside activities such as not being able to go to their jobs and day program, not being able to go shopping in the community, not being able to go out to eat, and their just their basic routines was completely interrupted. Regarding the ICF staff and the programming there, um, the staff ex the ICF experienced vacancies, and as what was indicated earlier by Ms. Jessica Adams, the staff uh, low, low staff of vacancies still continue to this day. Um, the ICF staff was considered essential workers and needed to be at the ICF uh, during the initial and continued stages of the pandemic, which resulted in low staff morale. There was a shortage of PPE equipment, which was uh, greatly affected by individuals who had COVID-19 and the staff who worked with them needed additional PPE items because the individuals had <clears throat> COVID. That is my last slide and I'll turn the COVID data back over to Ms. Tammy Siever. Thank you, John. For the record again, my name is Tammy Siever. And um, with, we go to the next slide, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, on the first two bullets, um, these are statewide statistics um, for COVID. So. Um, of confirmed cases of 60 and over, there was 16% of total confirmed cases. And for those 60 and over, COVID deaths accounted for 79% of total deaths. Um, some of our individual um, departments were um, able to um, collect data. So as you can see, our agency um, also had our issues dealing with COVID-19. Our ICS from April 20 of 2020 to present saw 90 confirmed cases that included staff and residents. Our, our developmental services, which included Desert Regional Center down in the south and the rural and the Sierra Regional Centers up north also had um, their person serves and provider staff and staff themselves. And with our community-based care, we had 451 confirmed persons served and unfortunately 126 deaths um, from complications of COVID. So this graph was provided by the Nevada Elders Count by our Office of Analytics. Older adults only not only faced higher rates of infection, but mortality of the virus itself. Death rates were more than tripled between the ages 70 and 74 and the 75 plus age group. The COVID-19 disease was also the third leading cause of death for people over 55 and older in 2020. I will now, thank you. Um, I will now will turn over the presentation to Jennifer Williams Woods, thank you. Good afternoon, Jennifer Williams Woods, for the record, State Long-Term Care Ombudsman. I'm gonna review our response to, um, to COVID um, as, a, as a division. So first and foremost, we were able to secure the federal funding, which many of you may be aware of. Um, our total number received was, uh, was nearly $25 million um, to provide assistance with various programs. So with the first rounds of um, the uh, disbursement, we had um, the Families First, the um, CARES Act, which was the Corona Virus Aid Relief and Economic Security. Uh, we also provided assistance with our um, from CARES Act with the No Wrong Door and our um, ADRC system. With the um, consolidation 
Consolidated Appropriations Act we had, um, which was by the Older Americans Act, and we had the SSA Title 20 um, uh, dollars rolling in as well. So, um, and then lastly, we had the American Rescue Plan Act, which was also part of the Older Americans Act, which provided additional services and um, increase for um, uh, services that we provided. And we also put uh, forth in fourth dollars for the public welfare or public health workforce. Next slide. So this graph demonstrates um, in many different ways, thank you, um, the ways that we spent the money, mo the majority of our dollars went to food security. As you heard er earlier, many of our seniors especially um, had issues um, accessing food services. Um, the next largest amount was spent for um, the health promotion, um, and then it was broken down pretty closely between caregiver services, the Nevada Care Connection, and then other services available for um, services within the state. So as we started our initial response to um, the COVID pandemic, um, our community-based care staff made sure that they looked at all of the active recipients and looked and examined them by looking at the risk level um, for each individual, their support system and availability of supplies and their other health and safety concerns to make sure that we were reaching those most at risk. Um, and they, those individuals, 240 of them were identified and contacted the first week of shutdown, which was again, um, that kind of the 10th or so of March around that time frame. Um, that's when the, that work began. Th over 3,400 re uh, recipients were contacted between March 16th and March 31st of 2020. And throughout the pandemic, our ADSD staff main maintained contact with all clients. And again, the focus being on those with high risk, again, not having much of a support system and needing the most assistance. Uh, most importantly, our adult protective services made sure that they continued their home visits during the pandemic. They may have looked a little differently, taken place on porches um, or outside to maintain the safety of both the clients and our adult protective <coughs> services staff. Next slide. We had a lot of innovations. We came together quickly. Um, and I would say, as demonstrated earlier with Jeff phoning a friend, myself, um, that's what we do. We're flexible and we really work well to um, do things on the fly, come together and work with our community partners. And one of the great, um, great, I guess, outcomes of that would be our Nevada COVID aging and network and response or Nevada CAN. And so this was a coordination of service providers to provide a rapid response to the immediate needs for food, medication, te telehealth services, and social support programs. And so many of us in the room were part of these various work groups to come together and brainstorm how folks could access those services better. And through that, we had some very innovative programs to really reach those individuals who are isolated to decrease that isolation and loneliness that many of us um, think of when we think of our populations and COVID. There were flexibilities in the Older Americans Act program. So we pivoted from home delivered meals and home delivered grocery programs, um, simplified that application process, and we really made other, or there were other flexibilities to support our older adults. Uh, we had additional legal service grant funding to respond to civil needs such as evictions for um, those needing um, were having difficulty paying their rent to keep them in their um, in their homes for as long as possible. The long-term care ombudsman program we used the CARES Act funding to purchase tablets for every single long-term care facility in the state. So that includes our skilled nursing facilities, um, residential facilities for groups, and homes for individual residential care. We also purchased visitation booths, which were clear plexiglass um, three-sided stations that could, um, the residents could sit behind and access their family members in person, which couldn't be done for quite some time. So that helped alleviate and increase the access to the residents um, from our program and others as well, and also the family members, most importantly. Um, to keep the residents um, kind of entertained, even though, as Juwan mentioned, those congregate activities couldn't take place. So this provided some activities for them to do and provided contact information to the ombudsman program. So we still had that lifeline to them. Our staff, again, as we mentioned previously, switched to um, making phone calls, using those tablets to make video calls with the, to the residents and staff in lieu of facility visits since we were 
shut out for quite some time. And then weather permitting, we were able to conduct window and outdoor visits to speak with residents um, when we could. Um, with our um, CBC waivers, our community-based care, there was a lot of flexibility with our Appendix K, which allowed us to have some alternative methods for service delivery. So our adult day care and jobs and day programs, um, providers were able to, um, services were provided in, their, in the client's homes um, using telephone, Zoom, Teams, and any other video um, communication or um, uh, audio communication available. Um, legally responsible individuals were allowed to be reimbursed for services to the clients, which was the change. Um, as we mentioned previously, those face-to-face -face interactions were modified to, um, to do use those various other instruments to maintain that communication and continuing with our person-centered plan. Um, and lastly, um, allowed uh, it was a, a retainer payments were made to job and day program providers when an individual was hospitalized or absent due to closure for um, COVID-19 for up to 30 consecutive um, service or billing days. So I know we ran through that rather, rather quickly, but we wanted to get all that information to you. So we'd be more than happy to entertain any questions. And we've got an, um, Ms. Carrie Greeley also here from our community-based care program to answer questions as well. Thank you very much for your presentation. And thank you for your hard work during these unprecedented times. Um, there wasn't a playbook for you to go by. So appreciate all your hard work for you and your staff. A committee, do we have any questions? No. Anyone virtually? Seeing none, thank you again for your presentation. At this point, I think we're going to take a 30 minute recess for lunch. So um, let's come back at 1253. Thank you very much.
Welcome back to the Legislative Committee on Senior Citizens, Veterans, and Adults with Special Needs. For the next item of business, we have Mr. Barry Gold, Director of Government Relations with AARP Nevada, here to give us an overview of federal and state initiatives pertaining to senior citizens. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Again, for the record, my name is Barry Gold. I'm the Director of Government Relations for AARP. Before I forget, I'd like to thank you for inviting AARP to participate. On behalf of the 345,000 AARP members, I like to mention whenever I testify. I wanted to mention just very briefly the history of this committee. I remember when Kathy McLean was running around the legislative building the last week trying to get this through, and she actually did. And we've been working with this committee ever since then getting some important issues that are heard on seniors, vets, and adults with special needs, which often don't find themselves in front of the other committees. So this is a great committee, and I'm so glad to be able to be here and to continue to participate. And I'll talk about the piece of legislation that really kind of saved this committee a little bit later. Um, I wanted to first of all say that... Um, the, the information you heard this morning was fabulous, and there was a lot of great information. There was a lot of interesting things that were said, a lot of things that um, I would have liked to have commented on, but that's not why you invited me. Um, so there's other things. I'd like to also mention that AERP, um, I serve on the Commission on Aging, and we look at a lot of those issues and a lot of those things you've heard in ongoing oversight and evaluation, a lot of things that ADSD and Medicaid are doing. So there's people out there keeping their eyes on this and making sure that um, our older adults, people with disabilities and um, adults with special needs and veterans are being looked at. So I just wanted to assure you of that. Um, and with that, um, and I looked at the uh, responsibilities of the committee, and some of it sounds like my job too. That's kind of interesting. But I wanted to first talk about um, a lot of the things that were done. This is by no means a comprehensive list of all the legislation that affected older adults. There was a lot of things, and a lot of things, and trust me, a lot of lobbyists came up to me during the session, or actually called me since we weren't there, and said, Barry, I got a bill you want to look at. And yes, there was an effect on older adults at some things, but it may have been outside our public policy, or it might have had a minor effect. So there's a lot of things. So I'm going to focus on a lot of the things that AARP looked at, and some of the other things. So I'll start off with AB 35. And AB 35 was a bill that kind of changed the eligibility requirements for some of the services from a fund for the fund for a healthy Nevada which is a funding source and it lowered the eligibility from the age of 62 to 60 and it was a bill that was brought forth by ADSD and it was a great bill and it also uh, combined some programs and now it's for seniors and disabilities so that was AB 35. AB 76 was an enabling piece of legislation that allowed the Veterans Administration to investigate and operate an independent um, adult daycare center. You heard about adult daycare center, so the veterans could open their own, which is really great because they have a separate funding source and it wouldn't cost the state money. And if indeed they do go down that road and they open it up, sometimes there's these waiting lists you heard about, so veterans who needed adult daycare could possibly get those services without going on a waiting list, and it would actually save the state money in the state program. So it's a win-win for everybody. So that was a great bill, and that one passed. AB 177 is what I call the RX labeling bill, and it allowed for you to put a language on your prescription pill bottle on how to take your prescription drug. So it's not the name of the drug, it's how to take it. So take one three times a day. And that's really important because you've heard me say before about life-saving prescription drugs don't work if you can't afford them. Life-saving prescription drugs don't work if you don't know how to take them. So that was a great piece of legislation. Um, Teresa Benitez Thompson was behind that one, and it's really going to be helping. I don't know how it's being used, but what a great idea. So people can pick up their pill bottle and they say, do I take one of these once a day or two of these three times a day? They can read it in their own language, and that's fabulous. AB 190, I could talk talk about all day. That was the caregiver sick leave bill. Third time was a charm. We got it passed. I'm so pleased about that. So um, caregivers who are, who are still employed, and if you remember, I said 60% of them are, if they already earn and receive sick leave, sick leave, sick pay, paid or unpaid, they can use a portion of that to care for someone else. And we learned just how important that was during the pandemic, that people were taking care of each other. So AB 190 passed. 
AB 216 allowed for cognitive assessments and care planning for younger people. It allowed them to be added to the state plan services before you had to wait until you were like 65. And by then it may have been too late. So if we could do these cognitive assessments on people who had um, different forms of cognitive impairment, it would really help them get the assessment they needed and some of the care planning, which could really help improve the quality of their lives as they've aged. Um, AB 217, um, I like to call the unlicensed caregiver uh, training bill. Um, that took a few sessions to get done. And what it did is that it really, we finally found a way to get everybody to agree on it. It allows the Board of Health to establish regulations that say what type of facilities, because we all know that like people in nursing homes, okay, nursing homes that are, get Medicare funding, places like that, or Medicaid funding, there's certain training that's required. It's in statute. They know what it is. But a lot of the smaller facilities, whether it be, you know, I'm not, I'm going to say the group homes, and I may be wrong, or some of these smaller facilities, there's nothing in statute on what kind of training they need and how often they need it. I always used to like to say we're really good at having fingerprinting and background checks but not a lot else. So you want to know if you're going to go in one of these places or you're going to put your mom or your dad there, that the people that are inside those doors know what they are doing. So we finally got this one done, and the Board of Health will make regulations on the type of facilities, so who it applies to, and what topics and what training they're going to receive, as well as finding internet sources for free or low-cost training. So it's not going to be very, very expensive to make sure that these people get the training that they need. Um, also, with what was going on with the pandemic, it's also about infectious, infectious disease programs, that these facilities needed to have one, because a lot of them didn't always have something like that. They might have had TB control stuff, but infectious disease. Things like cleaning, wiping down surfaces, all of a sudden, we all learned a lot about that. And then there was some oversight with that as well, in terms of how they were going to oversight this training. AB 344 was what I call the hospital transition bill, um, and that's they were going to look for funding, and I think ADSD is moving forward with this. It's for people going from their hospital to their homes, not into facilities, and it includes caregivers, um, older and disabled people, to develop programs to help include people in the plans and give better plans because if you can have a good plan to send them home from the hospital, they're going to stay home, and they're not going to have any readmission. So that was another good one. Um, AB 433 is why we are all here today. That was the bill that changed the interim structure, and it eliminated a lot of committees. I will not say they were un unnecessary. People who followed those committees, their hearts were broken, perhaps, because they didn't, they didn't stay. But this committee, since we've been involved with that, and I mentioned that these issues are so important, um, a lot of different people spoke up and they said, we need to save the senior committee because it is so important for the seniors, the vets, and adults with special needs. And this one was saved. This one was, was one of the, at the very end, it got pulled out of the fire, so to speak, and that's why we're here today. And I'm so pleased that that happened. So let's go on. These are the health ones. So let's go on to um, the next one, which is SB5. And SB5 was the telehealth bill. And what it really basically allowed, it said insurance would pay for audio-only telehealth. And that's really important because not everybody has a computer with a camera or a smartphone with a camera. Some people who live, for whatever reason, for whatever reason, they may only have a telephone. And that we found out how important telehealth was, especially early in the pandemic, where everybody was told, stay home, don't go anywhere. So that allowed them to get some health care, things like that. So that was really important. They also had something in there to create a dashboard on the access on who was using, who was using telehealth. Um, and we urged um, the people who were, the, I think it was somewhere in HHS and, the, and that dashboard to include, the, you know, it was gender, it was, uh, it was gender, it was race, it was income, it was all that. We urged them to also collect data on caregivers who are accessing it, and age. Is it younger people who are looking at this? Is it older people who are looking at it? It's kind of nice to know if older people, you've heard about 211. 211 is the information and referral line. 
Well, a majority of people, the last I heard, were older people that looked at that. So it's nice to know who's using these services. Um, the next one was SB 19, and that's a background check bill. And it really allowed the state system to coordinate with the federal system a little better to make sure that we were doing some good background checks on people, to knowing sure, again, when you had someone going to a facility, the people who are working there are trustworthy. Um, there was another bill, SB 340, which was the Home Care Board Bill, and that had some oversight of personal care and respite workers. That bill's a little bit controversial. I won't go into it right now. It talked about wages for personal care. It talked about some training and some other issues, and there's some concern, perhaps, that it's going to be helpful in terms of making sure they earn a living wage, and there's places to look at in case things happen wrong, but some of the providers were saying, if we're going to pay them way too much, maybe they're going to go out of business. So it was one of those things. There is a balancing act and all that. So that was SB 340. But it does impact older adults who are going to be receiving care from these, from these um, home care workers, personal care workers. SB 341 is the disparities bill, and that's about programs and training. Um, it allowed the state to get for, to look for grants that were going to look for health care and behavioral health outcomes. They send reports to the legislatures on the efforts to reduce disparities in health care. Um, it specifically mentioned kidney disease and what was happening in kidney disease and disparities in that. And it also looked at other state programs and looking at reducing disparities in that, and also talks about training for state state employees on dealing with disparities and trying to get equitable health care outcomes. SB 380 is the Rx Transparency Bill. We were the first state in the country to have a transparency bill saying that I believe it was diabetes drugs had to – it was diabetes drugs or it was asthma drugs. I can't remember now. If they rose over a certain, a certain threshold, the companies had to report why, what was behind the cost of that. Two years later, we added diabetes or asthma, whichever was the other one. But, you know, that just wasn't good enough. So last session we did all drugs, all prescription drugs that are over $40 in what they called a single course of therapy. So they really looked at one month of treatment. So that was a controversial, exactly what that is, over $40 for a single course of therapy that went up over 10% in one year or 20% in two years. They had to provide to the state information on why. The info is going to be presented at a public hearing. It includes now manufacturers, wholesalers, wholesalers and PBMs. Okay, if you know anything about the prescription drug process in the chain, it is a complex one. So it kind of includes everybody to know what's happening in that. It talks a little bit about penalties and what they're used for. Before, the penalties, if they didn't do it, were only used for um, education about diabetes and asthma. Well, now we're collecting information about all prescription drugs so they can use that information for more. SB 396 is the Rx purchasing bill. It allows the state and public entities to enter into group purchasing things. That is why the governor announced that Nevada was joining the Northwest Drug Consortium, which is this fabulous thing, which Oregon and Washington started and we are joining. Um, the good description by it, it's by states, for states. Um, it's kind of changed name. It's now called Array Healthcare. Um, and every prescription drug that is FDA approved, there's no formularies. If you enroll, once the state enrolls us in this Northwest Drug Consortium, Array Health, is anybody, regardless of whether you have insurance or not, can enroll in that. As I said, all FDA approved drugs are there, and there's discounts on generic drugs and non-generic drugs. And if you have insurance, you can decide if your insurance is cheaper, use your insurance. If your insurance is more money, you can use them as well. As we've all seen sometimes, sometimes your insurance company, they make you pay a little more for generics, and they make you pay a little something because it may be there. So that's a way, great way to get some lower-cost prescription drugs into the hands of people, and that's so important. Prescription drugs are the largest driver of the cost of health care. Um, and then there's SB 420, and SB 420 was certainly talked about a lot. That's the public option bill, and what it does is it asks the state to design, establish, and operate a public health insurance option that people can buy. Um, it also says that um, they may offer it to small businesses, and that's a decision they're looking at. And so they're looking to reduce costs and how that's going to happen. It has to reduce 
costs over a certain threshold of 5% over certain things and then 15% over the cost of for the first four years that it's going to be in operation. Um, right now, there requires an analysis to be done. There's a lot of input. I've been following those meetings and learning all about that. It doesn't start for several years. I want to say it's 2026, something like that, before it would be operating. So we'll see how that goes. We have to do something to lower the cost of prescription drugs. There's no reason why Americans pay three times as much as any other country. Um, well, let's see. 420 also talked about pregnant women and doulas, not something AARP paid a lot of attention to that part of the bill, even though we are 50 plus, so there are probably some 50-year-old women out there that are getting pregnant or there are some doulas out there that need to get paid. So um, we, were, we looked at that. Um, and the other thing was all Medicaid managed care organizations the contract with the state, had to submit a good faith RFP to participate in that. So it kind of guaranteed people would at least want to play that we were contracted with. Then the other thing in terms of health that I'm going to mention um, that passed um, was HCBS. You heard a lot about home and community-based services. For those of you who have, I didn't list that on, on the thing I see Assembly MacArthur, you're looking, what is budget? That's not on there. But that's really important. Those of you who have heard me testify before, you've heard me talk about home and community-based services, and I, heard, I was so glad to hear they say they said it's half the price. It's actually about four to one. Between four to one and five to one, people can be taken care of at home as opposed to being in a nursing home. I will never say nursing homes are not necessary. There will always be some people who require 24-hour skilled care, and that may be the best place for them, but it is better, easier, and cheaper for a lot of people. I love to talk about when I talk to groups, I say, who wants to go into a nursing home? Raise your hand. And not a hand goes up because people understand they'd much rather be taken care of at home with the independence and dignity, which is where they want to be. So this past session, I was so pleased during the budget hearings that not that I ever chide people in budget hearings, but I ask pointed questions, as you know. But um, it was the decision was made to fund both the growth and the, to eliminate the waiting list for the HCBS programs. A dream come true. I can retire now. You did it. Okay, that was so great. I was so glad to hear that. And they also funded the staff to implement it. So. The waiver slots are funded by slots. They're called slots, okay? That's like a position. But I always like to say slots are people. So you understand it's a person to do that. Well, if you give the state 150 more slots and they don't have the staff to actually implement it, it doesn't work. So thank you so much. Teresa Benitez Thompson, you understand that. You made sure that the staffing got there. So that is really great. So now we will truly be able to take care of people where they need to be. Okay, the other things that we did that were not health care was AB 321 was the election bill. And what it really did is it made permanent the, the changes that were done during the special session, dealing with mail ballots, people getting mail ballots for the elections. Um, it, it also talked about early voting sites. I believe it said there needed to be so many in certain counties. Talk about deadlines to when the mail ballots had to be returned, how you could opt out of a mail ballot. Um, it talked about a lot of those things, and it talked a little bit about signature verification. I'm not going to talk about that controversial subject, but it did discuss that a little bit. So that was the election bill, and that affects older adults because, as we all know, who votes? Who, is, who, who are the itinerant voters, older adults? And we need to make sure they have the opportunity to make their voice heard in whatever way they're most comfortable doing. AB 388, making sure, is the broadband bill. And what this one did is it created a voluntary fund to make grants to help people look at um, what was going on with broadband. It also required a report to be done on where underserved areas were done. So that's really important, but I have better news to talk about when I talk about some federal initiatives. SB 150 is, is a, I want to say, a cute little bill. It's the tiny house bill. If you remember the tiny house bill, it allowed um, different people with populations in cities and counties to change their zoning to allow tiny home parks. So that was kind of a nice little thing that happened. We all know about affordable housing. 
Affordable housing is a big issue in our state. So this is a new, unique form of affordable housing. So that was kind of an interesting idea. So that's the tiny house bill. SB 284 is affordable housing tax credits, how you obtain them and how to use them. I'm not going to say much more about that. If you want to know more about that bill, ask Julia Ratty. Okay, that's one of those subjects that I listened to her in the hearing and she talked about the housing tax credits and I said, oh, I understand how those works. When I walked out of the room, it's like, well, what did she talk about? It's a very complex thing. We need people who understand the tax credits in affordable housing because something has to be done. But that was a nice bill. SB 311 is rural housing affordable housing, and it allows rural housing authorities to create nonprofits to own and operate affordable housings for low and moderate income people. Again, ask Julia Ratty. She can tell you more about that one. Um, so what are some of the things that didn't happen? What are some of the no-goes that didn't happen in terms of looking at um, older adults? One of them you heard about before was AB 407 was the order of protection for vulnerable adults. Now I will tell you that was this committee's BDR. This committee submitted that BDR and it didn't make it. Well, why didn't it make it? Because it got released very, very late. It got released very late, kind of like the middle of May. There were some language things that had to happen with it. Um, and it was one of those bills that involves um, attorneys and lawyers, okay? And I, there are some, uh, some attorneys that I'm looking at right now, and sometimes it takes them just a little while to get all the language agreed upon, okay? And the bill came out so late that there wasn't time to do that. I know they're still working about that. I will tell you there are 28 states that have something very similar in place, and it's really important to have something like that. Um, it's specific to vulnerable adults. I could go into it more, but I don't think I need to. Um, I can tell you Jennifer Richards, um, who I believe you heard from earlier today, is still working on this bill. I spoke to her yesterday, and um, if you want to know more about that and do another BDR and get this across the finish line, they would really like that. They would like to have that. A national expert from Justice and Aging said this type of order is a critical tool for restorative justice. So just a thought, just a thought that I'll throw out there. SB 56 didn't make it. That was a telehealth bill for audio only for behavioral health, saying they had to do behavioral health that way. You get into the issue of behavioral health parity, and sometimes that's a big black hole. Um, that's, that bill did not make it across, but SB5 did, so we got one of the audio onlys. But let's be fair to behavioral health. We've all learned how things are going to happen. Um, SB218 um, was tenants' rights, and it had a whole lot of stuff in it. It was a very comprehensive bill, and sometimes the more things you throw in it, it, it didn't make it across the finish line. And SB200 um, is one of my favorites. It's Work and Save. Work and Save is a plug-and-play system. It is for employees who have no way to save through their employer. And what it is, it's an auto 401k, auto, for, auto IRA program that costs the employer nothing. They don't contribute. They just offer it to their employees who can say, yes, I want to do it, or no, I don't want to do it. A little bit of money comes out of their check. It is not matched by the employer. There is a fiscal agent that does it. Like I say, it's a public-private partnership, and that way people can start saving for retirement. So when they retire, they have means instead of needs. Several states have passed it before the, re before the pandemic. A few states have even passed it during the pandemic. There's a very interesting program in Oregon, who's the first one, who said that you can join their program. Sometimes there's a startup cost of like a million bucks or more, and that can, states go, oh, wait a minute. But if you can join another program, that's another way to look at that. Just another thought I'm throwing out there. Um, so those are some of the things that didn't make it. The next thing I want to talk about is state initiatives. Well, you know what? I have a different thing here. Let's see. State initiatives. State initiatives are things that are happening around the state, and I think that could be the very last one, depending on which one I sent to you. I had two versions of this, but there is one that says state initiatives. Could be one of the last ones. AERP sent letters to the governor talking about Medicaid redeterminations, and I mentioned that to a couple people during the break. And during the public health emergency, States were not allowed to disenroll people from Medicaid. And that was important because there was so much going on, people needed health care. So after the public health emergency is over, they're going to start doing the redeterminations, 
and people might get disenrolled. Their income might be too high. There's a lot of different things. There were some exceptions made to allow people to enter Medicaid. So we sent a letter saying we need to make sure we don't disenroll people inappropriately. Let's say they move during the, and we don't have their address. Things have gone on. We need to make sure that not everybody who's on Medicaid is that good at answering mail and looking at things and following, I don't want to say following directions, but doing the complex steps that it requires. So we sent a letter to that and we've been working with Medicaid and with welfare and they're doing some things to make sure that they're doing outreach to make they sure everyone's addresses, how they can do automatic referrals using information from other programs, maybe income levels, things like that, so it's not such an onerous process to get involved. And the other thing that's really important, if people are being disenrolled because their income is too high, they lost their job during the pandemic, so they were eligible for Medicaid, and now they got a job again. So they don't el they're not eligible anymore, but they may not have insurance. They will be auto-referred to Nevada HealthLink, the, the health insurance exchange, so then they can buy insurance through, through HealthLink. So that's really important. So I was really glad about that. We sent another letter to the governor and to Director Whitley about booster shots in nursing homes. You heard about COVID response in nursing homes. We actually did better than most states in terms of the number of deaths. Some states, 30 and 40% of the deaths in the state were in nursing homes. Imagine that. We were much lower. We were somewhere between different times during the pandemic, 8%, 12%. So you think about that, that's really good. Part of that is we have so few nursing homes are here because we do home and community-based services. So that's really great. So we sent letters because the booster shots, we did kind of okay in terms of the first initial vaccines, but in terms of getting booster shots, it's pretty appalling. Um, the last that I looked, I think we were third from the bottom in um, residents that had regular shots and booster shots. And the staff was doing just a little better. So we really need to find a way to reach out. And AARP is working with the Nevada Vax, Nevada Vax Equity Coalition and Immunize Nevada on developing some messaging to reach out to the nursing homes in terms of how do we how do we message, how do we get boots on the ground to give these people shots and to make sure that the booster shots get done as well. The initial shots were really good, but we need to, we know these are the most vulnerable. These are the people who, if they get it, are liable to have the worst outcomes. So what can we do and how can we do that? And who do we reach? So the nursing home residents is an interesting question. Are there, if they have guardians, then the guardians are the decision makers, whether they get a shot, perhaps. If the staff has to go in and say, hey, you want to get a booster shot? And the person goes, what? I, I don't know. I don't like shots. That's, that, that doesn't work. So we need to figure out a way to do that, and they're going to help us do that because they've done messaging that works, and they also know how to get boots on the grounds in the facility. So we're really pleased about that. Some of the state initiatives that we are um, working on is that Work and Save, like I said, it's going on in several states, both last year and this year. Um, we'll see if there's sponsors in the state that are still looking to look at that. I know it's taken a couple of sessions. This bill usually takes a few sessions to get it across. I know the treasurer is very interested in this. Like I said, this saves the state's money. It, it enables um, st stable retirements for people in the future. Um, HCBS, I already talked about that across the country. We're looking at protecting funding, doing all things, some rebalancing, making sure there's more people at home than in nursing homes where it's cheaper, looking at the waiting lists. Um, prescription drugs, people are looking at prescription drugs. Um, rate setting boards, um, whether it be price boards, co-pays, price gouging, there's a lot of different things, transportation, importation, there's a lot of things states are doing at a state level. Did you know that there is an importation bill on the books? In Nevada, I, I don't see a lot of head shaking. There is an importation bill that was done a dozen years ago or more, and it was very simple. It said that the, the Board of Pharmacy could license online Canadian pharmacies, and then people could go there to do that. What a unique way to do that. They, I, think, I believe they three pharmacies applied, but they never advertised it. They never really pushed it. And so as far as I know, it's still on the book, but other states are doing some other things for importation. We need to look for that. There's a few states that are doing price gouging. So if there's any price gouging going on, the attorney general can look at that. Um, broadband. Broadband is... Um, 
Another thing that's really important that's not listed up there, states are working on broadband. What I'll say is we sent a letter to the governor about broadband and the ARPA funding, and I mentioned this um, in another place as well, but the governor announced he's going to spend $500 million in ARPA funding on making sure broadband is accessible to people all over the state, and that's really a big deal because there really is a digital divide in our state. Um, Access to quality, affordable health care, you have heard me use that phrase over and over and over again. Consumer protection things, payday lending, renters, fraud, utilities, affordable housing we talked about, including uh, accessory dwelling units. I know there's a lot of talk about what I'll call rent stabilization or price controls on rents. That is something that typically is not a statewide idea. There are some people that have talked to me about having making sure there's no state presumption that they're going to stop, that they're going to allow municipalities to do that. So I've been talking to people about that. And that's something to consider because we have to figure out something. The last thing, somebody had their rent raised like 6,000%, something just outstanding. That's, that's an indication they want you to move. Um, but, you know, people shouldn't have that happen to them. So all those things on here, a lot of things here are basically what you see me come to the table for, a lot of the things we do. So that's what's happening. I will also mention one other thing, and that has to do with nursing homes, and that's the nurses' compact. As we've had trouble, we didn't even get a hearing last time. Several of us, the bordering states have the nurses' compact. We talked about the doctor shortage. We also have a terrible nursing shortage. You've heard about how UMC nurses had forced mandatory over time and they weren't happy about that so what we can do about that at least to give it a hearing and have people talk about the nurses compact nurses who may want to work here and these are licensed trained nurses and what we could do about that federal let's talk about federal stuff right now um, there's a lot of state and local funding um, that went from the American Rescue Plan Act um, there's a lot of different things. The ACA marketplace exchanges like hemp, like, like, like Nevada HealthLink, they had expanded eligibilities to get subsidies. Um, the, the, the premiums were limited to 8.5% of income. So they really help people to provide insurance, and that was important. Medicaid was really important because they, they increased the FMAP, which is the federal matching program for the states, they increased it for if people would do certain things for HCBS. So they submitted a spending plan, and everything in the spending plan got approved by the state, okay? But they're taking it to IFC a little bit slowly. So they're taking it to IFC a little slowly, and there's, and there's things that are coming that are going to take some time. Um, they already had the provider cuts were restored where you had to cut the provider rates during the special session. They restored those provider rates so they were made whole so they can stay in business. They did things on workforce where they uh, did, did a one-time $500 payment and we were not nearly the only state that did that so people would stay in their jobs. Those personal care workers would stay in their wards. More of those are going to come when I talk to the, uh, the Medicaid division. They said the spending plan was approved and they're going to be bringing them to IFC slowly of one at a time. Oh. No. Oh. Like I said, I had two versions of that. So there's a state, state, state and local funding, the marketplace exchanging, the Medicaid, the increased um, FMAP, Medicaid expansion, uh, the American Rescue Plan had expansion involved. We are a Medicaid expansion state, so that didn't apply to us, but it really encouraged states to do that, to get people poor insurance. Um, in the American Rescue Plan, there was pension plan relief, which really helped multi-employer pension plans. Something called the Butch Lewis Emergency Pension Plan Relief Act has provided $94 billion in safe pensions for about 3 billion people. Again, don't ask me questions about that. If you want to know more information, I'd be glad to talk to my national office. They're the ones who sent me some of this national information because they track a lot of that. The other thing that came from the ARPA funds were the emergency rental and homeowner assistance. I know a lot of, a lot of different agencies. I know some of the legal aids. You spent a lot of time connecting people to these plans so they could stay in those homes. So those are really, really important. Um, so the next one that's federal is the Infrastructure and Jobs Act. And that was, again, provided state and local funding. It had a lot to do with 
transportation, public transit, safe streets, transportation alternatives. I mentioned the broadband before for deployment and infrastructure. The governor announced he's going to spend $500 million on infrastructure and more to make sure people did that when di digital equity and training. So that's really important. And then there's a permanent subsidy program that was created called the Affordable Connectivity Program. It used to be the BBB. And I don't remember what the BBB stands for, but now it's the ACP. It's the Affordable Connectivity Program. It gives you a $30 a month discount, $75 tribal. There's a $100 discount on a device. There is criteria for that, income and others. If you need more information, you can go to the acpbenefit.org. So a lot of the things that happened federally were, were funding things during the pandemic. The Build Back Better Act, which is so far stalled right now, isn't going anywhere, and we don't know when it's going to come up. Had some great things for prescription drugs. So prescription drug costs included things like Medicare negotiation, $35 insulin copay, which is a life changer for people on insulin, and $2,000 out-of-pocket for Part D drugs, out-of-pocket cap. Um, there also was a hearing benefit for the first time. That's another dream come true for Barry. You're going to have a hearing Benefit in Medicare, wow, what a deal that is. Well, the Build Back Better Act is, is stalled right now. We don't know what's going to happen to it. Um, sick leave was originally also in there, and that's that we're going to have some paid sick leave for people. Um, that was very controversial. There's a few people who I will not mention who said that was a sticking point. No, no, no. Um, we'll see what happens, whether that stays or not. Nursing home staffing was in there, and that's something else I wanted to mention in terms of federal or state initiatives to look at besides a nursing compact. One of them was something as simple as the staffing and making sure there was a registered nurse on staff at all times. Sometimes they have RNs, sometimes they have LPNs. So that make sure that there is an RN on staff at all times and perhaps looking at staffing ratios because we had some trouble with nursing homes being short staffed. You have to be very careful with staffing ratios because when you have a staffing ratio sometimes that becomes the ceiling and not the floor. So that's just always something to look at, and that's something why you need to make sure that it's sufficient. Um, and housing is something that was also included in the Build Back Better Act. But right now, that's stalled. I did the state initiatives already. So the other things that happened federally were stimulus payments. AARP was very involved in the last round of stimulus patients for $1,400, and we wanted to make sure that dependents also got the $1,400, including adult dependents. They were not included more. Also to make sure the people on Social Security, SSI and SSDI, and veterans were eligible for that. Another bill that we wanted in the Build Back Better Act, but it's also moving separately, is something called Credit for Caring. Caregivers spend an average of 24% of their income take caring for other people they know. This is a $5,000 federal tax credit for caregiving. There's eligibility requirements and you have to do certain things, but it's a no way for caregivers who, are, like I said, spend 24% of their income. People of color spend more than that. They spend up to 30, 35% of their income. AARP is still working on that. We're still seeing if we can get that across the finish line. There are many states that are working on that state by state by state. We do not have state income tax, so we are not going to work on that here. So we're glad about that. Um, the other thing that happened federally was the Fraud and Scam Reduction Act that allows the FTC to do more for response and prevention. That also passed recently, and that's a great, great thing right there that's going to help people. And that's it. And all that I'll say, if I have any questions, please ask me questions. And again, thank you for inviting AARP to participate in this process. We look forward to working with the committee. I'd like to thank LCB for everything that they do. They make this process so much easier for everyone. And what I forgot to mention in the beginning is you heard a presentation from ADSD about their COVID response. I would like to thank them, and I'd like to thank Dina Schmidt individually as the director of ADSD for what they did to make sure services were there. They put together that program called Nevada Care, Nevada CAN, C-A-N, and it was this fabulous program that put providers and community providers and advocates and people together to make sure we were getting out there to make sure the people that needed help got help. So thank you very much on behalf of the 345,000. Thank you so much for the presentation. I almost feel like I should stand up and clap. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I really appreciate this presentation. It was a really great overview. Um, committee, any questions?
Vice and Chair I, Spearman. And I apologize that the presentation was different there than what I was talking about. But it kept you busy, didn't it? <laughs> we figured it out. Thank you. <laughs> Vice Chair Spearman, please go forward with your question. Um, thank you. And um, thank you, Mr. Gold. Um, I really appreciate your thoroughness. And um, uh, I echo your, um, your gratitude regarding how um, ADSD has um, has helped out during the pandemic. A couple of things, uh, just a couple of comments. Um, I know there there was a little bit of consternation and for some reason, some uh, controversy about uh, the mail-in voting, but uh, I wanna say thank you for working with uh, some of the veteran, veterans organizations uh, to make sure that we were able to get that done because I've heard from veterans and veterans who are in that category of seniors as well, uh, for whom knowing that they will have that as a, uh, a permanent option, at least right now, uh, has been very gratifying to them. So veterans, and I've also heard from, uh, had an opportunity to talk to a Gold Star widow um, last Saturday, uh, talking about uh, the uh, mail-in voting option. So thank you. Um, the hearing aids, I, ironically enough, I just got a, um, a text the other day from someone trying to figure out how they might be able to uh, pay for hearing aids. So um, my challenge is going to be, uh, will you please um, ask the national uh, AARP office to stay on top of that uh, Build Back Better plan? I have no idea why hearing aids is controversial to people, uh, especially when we have medical evidence that shows that uh, hearing loss when not uh, dealt with uh, also advances um, dementia and Alzheimer's and some other cognitive issues in um, older people. Uh, last but not least, I'll, I'll say this. We have, um, in 2019, we passed um, pay equity uh, here in Nevada. And I'm just gonna ask if you all can get with NERC, Nevada Equal Rights Commission, and uh, see how that might be faring. Uh, because one of the things that um, was a motivator for me in carrying the bill is the fact that you have more women who retire in poverty than you do uh, men. And most of the time, at least more than 70% of the time, is because they've not been paid equitably. So I think that that pay equity, especially where we are now with respect to housing insecurity, uh, food insecurity and, and that sort of thing. I just want to make sure that we're doing everything that we can do to monitor, to make sure that the good actors are, um, are, are being thanked and the um, bad, act, bad actors, if you will, are being put on notice at, um, uh, about the pay equity. So thanks a lot. The voting piece uh, helped a lot of um, seniors and also uh, and help veterans who are in that uh, position and helped uh, some of our gold star uh, widows. That's women who've lost or spouses who have lost their um, partner uh, while on active duty or as an act of war. So thank you. Hearing aids, we got to get this done though because there are too many people who need the hearing aids and uh, a cheap pair as I understand or an ex inexpensive pair costs something like $3,000 and uh, talked to someone yesterday who uh, was quoted a price of about $8,000. And that's probably more than eight months of social security uh, payments or income that most people who rely on social security for their financial livelihood. So thank you. Continue to work Madam with us. Chair, Madam Chair, to you and through you to Senator Spearman, thank you for bringing up hearing aids, something I forgot to mention, which I do more than often than I want to we admit, is AARP also worked with the FDA who's coming out with a regulation for over-the-counter hearing aids. I don't know exactly how much they're going to be, but they will be much, much less pricey because you're right, they're very, very pricey. I don't want to admit and I don't want to pull my hair back and let you see what's sitting behind my ear right now. But uh, yes, they are very expensive. So having the over-the-counter kind, which I don't know how they compare, but it's something that people can, can access that would be cheaper. We were, we were instrumental in, in pushing that because something needs to be done, and we're not giving up on the Build Back Better Act, let me tell you that right now. If you've seen some of the commercials that are playing in Las Vegas lately about prescription drugs, um, we, are, we are very intent on doing something on lowering the cost of prescription drugs as well and looking at that comprehensive packages of health care. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And thank you, Vice Chair Spearman. Are there any other questions from the committee? 
Okay. Seeing none, thank you again for your presentation. For our next item on our agenda, we have Dr. Peter Reed, Director of the Sanford Center for Aging and the University of Nevada Reno School of Medicine, here to discuss elder qualities of life issues and healthcare concerns in Nevada. Dr. Reed, please proceed with your presentation when you're ready. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Chair Gorlo and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Peter Reed. I am the director of the Sanford Center for Aging at the University of Nevada Reno School of Medicine. I'm also a professor of public health. Um, and I also want to mention that I serve as the chair of the Nevada Task Force on Alzheimer's Disease. And um, I have been asked to talk today about quality of life and well being among elders and also to highlight. Uh, some of the initiatives uh, that the Sanford Center offers uh, to support quality of life. And I'm going to talk a little bit more big picture. Um, I've been listening in all day to your hearing. And so I want to thank you all for your continued attention. I know you have been inundated with all kinds of information, a lot of really good presentations uh, throughout the day with lots of facts and figures um, and uh, information on bills and all kinds of different things. So what, what I want to do today is talk uh, a little bit more conceptually. And first, I'm going to share my views on different dimensions of quality of life and well-being. So that we're all kind of on the same page with what that means. I also want to talk about uh, some of the key resource needs for supporting quality of life and well-being and how we can do that really through the aging services and healthcare continuum. Uh, and then also I'm gonna describe some of the key initiatives at the Sanford Center for supporting quality of life. Um, to get started, I think I probably don't need to go into a lot of details on population need. There were wonderful presentations earlier from our colleagues at the state agencies talking about the demographics uh, within our state, and particularly the elders count, uh, outlining kind of what a lot of the different health needs are. I will just say um, that we do live in a very rapidly aging state. Our population is getting older. And along with the aging process come some key health concerns. And those include comorbid chronic diseases, dementia and Alzheimer's disease, frailty, polypharmacy, and all of these different concerns that come along with the aging process have the potential to compromise health and well being, and also to compromise independence and activities of daily living. And because of the decrease in independence and activities of daily living that come along with some of these conditions, there's a need to provide supports and services to enable people to continue to live well. And so there, then we have to talk about, well, what are some of the challenges for meeting those needs across the continuum? And when I talk about the continuum of services, really what I'm referring to are uh, the community-based aging services. You heard a lot about those earlier but also long-term supports and services that people receive long-term care, as well as clinical and healthcare services that are available and the need for these elements really to be well integrated. And as I said, though, I wanna start by focusing really on quality of life and well-being. So quality of life is something, as you may imagine, that can be very subjective for people, right? We all kind of have our own definition of what our own quality of life is and, and what we want it to look like. Um, but what I will say is that when I think of quality of life as a professor of public health and someone who works in a school of medicine, I'm thinking about health related quality of life. Uh, and really, for me, that's about the outcome of health conditions and our ability to live one's life as they choose and to live where they choose. So do you have the ability, do you have a, a strong enough health related quality of life to live the life that you would choose and, um, and to be able to live where you would choose to live? And that ability is enabled or constrained by a variety of different dimensions. So when I think about quality of life and health related quality of life, I'm thinking about physical health or the different diseases, disease states that may compromise our physical abilities and activities of daily living. I'm thinking about emotional and mental health, um, which certainly when you think about mental behavioral health, there's a, a big concern there uh, for elders. I'm thinking about cognitive health and I draw a distinction between cognitive health or the functioning of the brain, um, such as which can be compromised by conditions such as Alzheimer's disease or dementia, and then emotional or mental health, uh, which are different psychiatric conditions that can compromise that. I'm also looking at social health. Do we have a network of people 
uh, to whom we can seek support and, and receive that support. Of course, financial health is an important element of our overall quality of life, as is environmental health and the conditions in which we live. Uh, many people also talk about spiritual health and having a sense of connectedness and meaning and purpose. So for me, when I think of quality of life, it's really those dimensions, physical health, emotional health, cognitive health, social health, financial health, environmental health, and spiritual health. And all of those dimensions need to be present to a certain degree to enable people to be able to choose how they're going to live and where they're going to live. Those dimensions really are the elements that get compromised when someone develops a chronic disease or develops dementia, develops frailty. Um, and, and so those are the kinds of things that you were implementing supports and services to enable people to maintain their independence and their quality of life across those different dimensions. However, I draw a distinction between quality of life and well-being. And I do this for a very specific reason. When I think of well-being, I think about the dimensions of ourselves or the dimensions of a person that really transcend those health-related conditions that can compromise our well-being. Uh, and what I mean by that is I'm talking about well-being, um, and, and this is a model that was developed by a group called the Eden Alternative International, uh, but they describe well-being as being identity or having a sense of personhood and being known to others, an opportunity for growth and continued learning and development, autonomy or self-determination, the ability to make decisions for yourself, security, feeling safe and that you have an environment in which you're comfortable, connectedness with others, having opportunities to connect with other people who bring meaning into your life, meaning and purpose, and also joy. And I contend and I believe that these domains of well-being can be supported at a high level despite the aging-related changes that come along with chronic diseases and dementia. Despite physical and cognitive limitations, we can still support well-being such that people have a sense of identity, growth, autonomy, security, connectedness, meaning, and joy. And so when I think about how we develop programs and deliver services to older adults, I certainly am thinking about those elements of quality of life and health-related quality of life that I mentioned before, supporting physical health, supporting cognitive health. But I'm also thinking about how we can transcend the challenges that come along with physical and cognitive limitations and help to support overall well-being. And so the question I ask then is, how can we support Nevada's elders? How can we meet these basic human needs by creating conditions that really do support quality of life and well-being? And the answer I keep coming back to is that we need a well-integrated, well-resourced continuum of supports and services that are built around the needs of the person. We need a system that is built to support people in receiving services in the manner that they choose to receive them and when they need them such that the elders themselves are directing their own experience within our support and services network so that they are truly person directed. So what do those needs look like? I think that ultimately at, at, in the current time, in my interpretation, a lot of this comes down to workforce, right? And there's the first element of the workforce in terms of ensuring that all of the elements of the continuum of services that are needed to provide support are present. Without those services present, people are not able to access the support that they need. But it's not just having the services accessible, it's also ensuring that the workforce has the knowledge and the skills that they need to deliver these services effectively, and that they have an understanding of all of the other services that exist so that there's integration across all of these different elements. So we need to train our existing and our future workforce to understand the needs of elders and to understand the service delivery strategies that are going to use person-centered approaches to enable people to have high quality life and well-being. We not only need the people or the professionals, the workforce that works there, but we need people with the right knowledge and the right skills. And that can only come not only through offering programs and services, but by training the people who deliver those programs and services to be effective. Aging is a whole life experience. You all know that. Each one of you is aging. I'm delighted to share that tomorrow, if you are fortunate enough to make it through the night, you will wake up a day older uh, and you will continue aging for the rest of your natural life. Um, and so our goal here is not to extend life indefinitely, but to promote quality of life and well-being in a way that enables people to live well. And aging is a whole life experience. 
So there are both needs and resources that are needed to meet those needs across the entire lifespan and in all of the dimensions of the human experience. So there are lots, of, I've talked a couple times about the continuum of services. There are lots of different elements to this. You heard a lot about these earlier from the presentations from ADSB, uh, but I just wanna to briefly touch on a couple of the ones that I see as the key elements of this continuum of services. I think of major dimensions to this. The first are the community-based aging services that are offered by professionals, both through state, county, and local levels, both through government agencies and nonprofit agencies. These include information and referral sources, opportunities for social support and meaningful relationships, food security, transportation, respite care, adult daycare, health and wellness programs, financial and legal planning, lifelong learning and civic engagement, among many others. Um, and so again, there's a aging services network that exists in the state of Nevada, both from the state level, the county level, the local level, with government and nonprofit agencies that are delivering these services from a variety of different funding sources every day to enable elders to live well and to get the support that they need to remain in their home in the community. The other bucket that I moved to that's still in those home and community-based services are home-based care options and opportunities. This includes home health, home care, homemaker services. And I just wanna draw a distinction because there is often confusion between home care and home health. So when I refer to home care, I'm talking about in-home personal aids that support people in their activities of daily living, right? So in-home care that support people with their everyday life. When I refer to home health, I'm talking about medical and skilled medical services that are being delivered within the home. And there are different funding sources for those different services, but they're both ways to help to enable people, um, to use the phrase that, that we talk about in the aging services world, enable people to age in place or to remain in their homes in the community and get the support they need to live well. However, and as Barry Gold mentioned previously, there are times when people need to transition out of their home. The level of support that they need exceeds what's possible from their family or from paid professionals coming into their home. Um, and so they often will move into long-term care, residential long-term care settings. So that includes independent living, group homes, assisted living, skilled nursing homes. Uh, these are places where people live and hopefully are living in the least restrictive environment possible for them to receive the support that they need to live well uh, and the services they need to engage in their activities of daily living that is aligned with their own individualized needs um, and, and that's where this idea of person-centered or patient-centered approaches to care really come into play, is that we wanna to get to know everything there is to know about a person and match the level of support that they're receiving to their level of need, as well as their strengths and what they're capable of doing so we can maximize their independence. I wanna also mention the other element um, to this continuum of supports, right? I just walked through home and community-based services and long-term care in the aging services realm but there's also healthcare and clinical services that are available to support people as well. And when I think about elders, I'm really thinking here about primary care, not just physicians, but also nurse practitioners and physician assistants, um, but also geriatrics care, who are healthcare providers specializing in care of older adults. And I think for our purposes in looking at elder health and well-being, also neurology and looking at the ability uh, to provide support for cognitive health. So primary care, geriatrics, neurology, these are clinical disciplines that need to be embedded across that continuum of aging supports and services, both on the community support side and the clinical side. And so the real question then is how do we ensure that all of these different elements that I just described are robust and well-supported, but also connected to each other? So that from a patient-centered perspective, from a person-centered perspective, they know how to access an immediate service, but then get connected to all of the other things that they may need to maintain their quality of life. And connecting those dots across that entire continuum or that entire system of support, in my view, really needs full integration and collaboration, but also training. Um, you know, people become very myopic, professionals become very myopic and very specialized in the work that they do. And they sometimes aren't as familiar with the other resources and opportunities that are being provided by others that could benefit the work that they're doing themselves. Um, so, you know, you think about just as an example, um, a diabetes self-management program, which would be a, a, a community-based health and wellness program to give 
people living with diabetes training they need to manage their own conditions. So it's education, it's self-efficacy, it's skills and knowledge. Well, uh, if there's a physician who's working with a patient who has diabetes and they're only looking at the medical management side of that and aren't aware of the opportunity for their patient to enroll in a self-management program to learn skills for themselves, then that's a missed opportunity. So it's really about connecting those dots. So we're taking advantage of all of the resources really from a person-centered perspective. And that goes across that entire continuum of services and supports. So now I'm gonna shift gears. I've talked uh, about what I see as the critical needs for elders and that larger system of support. But I was also asked to share a bit about the initiatives at the Sanford Center for Aging and the kinds of things that we contribute to this system of support. So I wanna share a bit about that. Um, first, though, I want to talk about COVID. You've heard several times about an initiative here in Nevada called Nevada CAN or the Nevada COVID-19 Aging Network Rapid Response. Um, that was led by the Nevada Aging Disability Services Division under the leadership of Dina Schmidt. And I was privileged to have the opportunity to work uh, with Administrator Schmidt in developing and delivering Nevada CAN. Um, ultimately, uh, over that year and a half, I mean, th this was a program, it was so rapidly developed. I just want to say, I think it's been mentioned before, but it was really understated when it was described before. This was a rapidly developed innovation here in Nevada that gained national attention um, and was launched. So I know for me, I, I got my stay at home order from the university on March 17th, uh, what was that? St. Patrick's Day, I guess, 2020. We were told, go home, don't come back. Um, and within two weeks, a planning period had taken place and the state of Nevada launched Nevada CAN. Its website went live on April 1st, 2020, after a two week planning period. And it created a triage system for mobilizing community-based aging services organizations in ensuring that elders across the state could stay home and stay connected to the food that they needed, the healthcare they needed, and the social support that they needed. And from April 1st, 2020 to the end of 2021, during that roughly 18, 20 month period there was a tremendous amount of support provided to older adults uh, there were pop-up food delivery groups that came together the primary one was called delivering with dignity but the, the food and medication delivery arm of nevada can delivered close to 600,000 meals to older adults during that 18 month period um, i was privileged to lead the telehealth action team as part of that we delivered over 20,000 telehealth visits to older Nevadans uh, through the partners that were a part of that telehealth group. There was an innovation called the NEST Collaborative or Nevada Insures Support Together, uh, which offered virtual social support. They delivered over 5,000 hours of virtual social support to elder Nevadans. And this initiative was developed so quickly, Nevada can, uh, and was so innovative um, that we were invited to present on it or to testify rather uh, about this initiative to the US Senate Special Committee on Aging. And that took place in June of 2020. Uh, and I had the honor of, of offering that testimony um, to the US Senate Special Committee on Aging about Nevada CAN. And it, I feel like it's something that you need to be aware of and, and really um, should be very proud of that Nevada uh, through its work in supporting elders during COVID was nationally recognized as a, a leader in innovation uh, and in rapid action. And that's because of Nevada CAN. So I just wanna mention that. <laughs> now, in terms of the Sanford Center for Aging, um, and by the way, I'm not taking credit for Nevada CAN at the Sanford Center for Aging. It was very much a statewide collaborative activity led by ADSD uh, and, and including dozens and dozens of organizations and partners. Um, but in the Nevada, or excuse me, in the Sanford Center for Aging, we have a wide range of direct services that we offer. We have the Sanford Geriatric Specialty Care Center. This is a clinic um, where we have an interdisciplinary comprehensive Geriatrics Assessment for Older Adults uh, is part of University Health, which is now part of Renown Health uh, as of this last October. Um, and so we see patients really with multiple chronic conditions, dementia and frailty. We get to know everything there is to know about them and we provide a care plan that goes back to their primary care provider uh, for them to implement in recommendations and supporting people. Um, our clinic is supported by uh, the Nevada Aging Disability Services Division, as well as by the Division of Public and Behavioral Health. So we're grateful for the support that we get from the state in delivering those clinical services. We also offer community-based wellness programs 
Um, these are supported by U.S. Administration for Community Living, uh, as well as the Nevada Division of Public and Behavioral Health. And through these, we offer health education for older adults on specific conditions and for specific opportunities. That includes diabetes self-management, diabetes prevention, fall prevention, chronic pain self-management, uh, strength and conditioning programs. So a wide range of different health education opportunities to support uh, quality of life for elders. We also offer direct in-home support uh, through a program called Senior Outreach Services that is funded again by the Nevada Aging Disability Services Division. This offers one-on-one -on -one in home companionship and social support for low income homebound elders uh, in Washoe County. We also offer transportation services with support from ADSD and also medication therapy management services uh, with support both from ADSD as well as DPBH. Our medication therapy management is worth calling out because it's a really innovative program through which we have a certified geriatrics pharmacist that does comprehensive reviews of the medications that someone is taking and looks for negative interactions between those. I mentioned earlier the importance of understanding polypharmacy among older adults. You know, lots of times people will have multiple healthcare providers who are prescribing different prescriptions or different medications without coordinating with each other. And these can cascade and they interact and create all kinds of problems. I, there's one story that I always share. It was several years ago, we had a client in our MTM program um, who was uh, an, an older woman taking 42 different prescription medications prescribed by seven different doctors. Um, and that's exactly what we're trying to identify are the risks associated with the negative interactions there and how the medication profile someone is taking um, aligns with their health status and their health needs. Those are the direct services that I, I want to mention at this time. Um, I also want to mention the training that we do, and th this is really important. I said that the way we're going to ensure that we have a well-integrated, well-connected system of support that inter intersects between the aging services world and the clinical world um, is through training. Uh, and we have a variety of different training initiatives that we offer. The, the signature initiative that we're engaged in is called ICECAP Nevada. Uh, and that is, of course, an acronym, which stands for Improving Care of Elders Through Community and Academic Partnerships. And I want to be sure you're aware of this because it is funded through the U.S. Health Resources and Services Administration with a grant in their program called the Geriatrics Workforce Enhancement Program. Um, and there are two of these grants in the state of Nevada. We have one at UNR at the Sanford Center for Aging, but there is also a GWEP or Geriatrics Workforce Enhancement Program grant at the uh, Geriatrics Group at UNLV School of Medicine. Uh, and between these two, these are five-year awards that we both received. Between these two, um, HRSA is funding about $1.5 million in geriatrics training each year for five years uh, in the state of Nevada. And it's highly unusual uh, that any state will receive two of these awards. And in fact, when we applied, the RFP from this federal agency said they would only fund one in each state. Uh, but somehow the, the good proposal writing out of UNLV and UNR, we were able to bring two of these into the state of Nevada. And so I encourage you to check out the good work that's happening uh, at UNLV as, as well as what we're doing at UNR. What these programs do is that they're providing training to primary care providers on how to offer what they call age-friendly health systems or using a framework called the four M's in their clinical work. The four M's stand for what matters to the patient, mobility, mentation, or dementia and depression, and medications. So as I said earlier, these are the critical things that we need to be thinking about. Frailty, medications, dementia, um, and then really making sure that it's being driven by the patient, that it's what matters to the patient that is front and center within this. Um, so we're teaching primary care providers about these four M's of providing good elder care. I wanna make an interesting point, um, which is that HRSA used to fund, and they still do to a certain degree, but their, their funding used to exclusively support uh, specialists in geriatrics. So training geriatricians, we're physicians specializing in geriatrics, geriatric social workers, geriatric pharmacists, they had a big portfolio of that. Uh, but about seven, eight years ago, they shifted their focus because they realized that nationwide, and it's true here in Nevada for sure, we will never be able to train enough specialists to care for the elders that are coming with the aging of the population. 
Therefore, they shifted their focus. And these geriatrics workforce enhancement grants are intended to train primary care providers to increase their basic level of competence in serving their older adults. To recognize, you know, also when they need to refer people to specialists, but to really use the specialists just for the most highly complicated situations and to enable basic geriatrics competence among primary care teams. So that's the goal of ICECAP Nevada. It includes a certificate program for primary care providers as well as health professions. We also deliver this training uh, through a series of what's, what's called Project ECHO. Project ECHO is a telehealth education initiative at the School of Medicine. Um, so we're training rural providers. Uh, our series is focused on dementia. Uh, we offer it twice a year. We also, through this initiative at UNR, have a program called Bravo Zulu. Uh, and Bravo Zulu is really innovative. It, it was actually a, a program developed by the Nevada Department of Veteran Services, who's one of our partners on this award. Um, and it is a training program for professional and family caregivers of veterans who are living with dementia. So this is a highly innovative 12 hour training program to give care providers the, the skills and knowledge they need uh, to support people living with dementia, but layered with veteran culture. So they understand the unique needs of veterans who may be experiencing dementia. At the Sanford Center, we also have our Nevada Geriatrics Education Center supported by ADSD. They provide trainings for rural uh, healthcare professionals, as well as a geriatrics lecture series, and also training to ADSD staff uh, through various contracts. We're also teaching students at UNR about gerontology through our gerontology academic program. And we have the OLLI program or the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, uh, which provides adult education uh, for elders living in the community. They have about 1,500 members uh, that participate in OLLI who are able to receive education courses on all kinds of different topics. Um, and uh, so that, that's a really robust way for us to provide community education for elders to for their own continued growth and learning and development. So what do I see as the biggest gaps? Um, I think statewide right now, and of course, we've just talked about a whole host of different things, right? That full continuum of services, the need for integrating community-based and clinical services to support older adults. Uh, but one of the biggest gaps that I see right now is a lack of clinical services for people living with dementia. Now, we do have some resources, certainly the Cleveland Clinic down in Las Vegas uh, has a very thorough and comprehensive approach to supporting people living with dementia. But statewide and in general, I do think there's a tremendous need to increase the emphasis on early detection of dementia, on accurate diagnosis of dementia, and on ongoing care management, community education, and support. Now, there are a lot of resources. There's an initiative called Dementia Friendly Nevada Initiative that exists uh, through a program called the Dementia Engagement Education and Research Program at the School of Public Health at UNR. That's supported by ADSD as well. They're building community strength uh, for enabling people living with dementia to live well. There certainly are a variety of community supports, the Alzheimer's Association. You'll be hearing from Charles Duarte here in a second, talking about some of these needs, lots of good community services. But I think the clinical services for dementia are what we really need to build on and then connect the enhanced clinical capacity with our already robust community supports and services and integrate all of those so that they're from a person-centered and person-directed perspective accessible and available. One of the ways we do that is through the work of the Task Force on Alzheimer's Disease. Uh, I mentioned I serve as the chair of that task force um, and Chair Gorlo has, has just joined us as a representative of the legislature on our, our task force. So we're really excited to have you join that work. We are currently working on developing our new state plan for Alzheimer's disease that will be released in January, 2023. It will have many different recommendations, both programmatic and policy recommendations um, that I commend you to uh, as you're looking for information about what needs to be done here in Nevada related to dementia. Um, but again, I see that as one of our biggest gaps is needing to enhance and build out clinical services for early detection, diagnosis, ongoing care management. And I will just say uh, to conclude that from, for as much as we do at the Sanford Center, for as much as we do across the Aging Services Network in Nevada, we know that this is not sufficient. It doesn't cover everything. Aging is a complex human experience and we need a complex but well-integrated effective system of support to meet the needs of that human experience. And I believe that to support quality of life and well-being, as I described them, we need a robust, well-integrated system that brings together community supports with 
clinical services, and that these must work in concert across these sectors to support a person-centered, or better yet, a person-directed experience in which they can access the services they need when they need them so they can live the life that they choose in the manner they choose in the location they choose. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Reed, for your presentation. Um, committee members, do we have any questions? Vice Chair um, Spearman, please go forward with your question. Thank you. I, I, I didn't want to disappoint you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Um, first, Dr. Peters, thank you so much for um, uh, for this presentation. I just have a couple of uh, questions, I guess. And uh, one of them I I, um, I asked to uh, asked to Mr. Gold when we were talking with uh, AARP. We know that the population is aging. Uh, what we don't know, or I don't know that we have addressed it, is how do we make sure that we are uh, recruiting the kinds of um, medical services and doctors, uh, technicians, nurses, the whole medical team. How, is there anything that we can do to make sure that we're recruiting um, experts in these various areas that will already be here as our population ages? That's number one. And number two, um, it struck me, I like what you said, you know, uh, the good news is they come this time tomorrow, you'll be a day older. And I think one of the things that we don't do well in our society is to um, honor aging and honor our elders. Um, and I have, a, I have a theory that if you don't die young, you're gonna get old. And um, it's surprising how quickly that happens, uh, 20 today and before you know it, you're 53 weeks from now. So how, how can we make sure that we are recruiting the kinds of medical experts um, or experts in the medical field dealing with geriatric medicine so that we've got the skill sets and the numbers of people that we need here in Nevada. And number two, how can we, um, what can we do now to begin to create a, um, to create an environment of cultural competency that respects um, aging, the aging process and the wisdom many times it goes with it because right now where we're going, the road that it looks like we're going down now is anybody anybody over the age of 40, eh, you know, get out of here and maybe you don't matter. So, and that's that's being a little facetious, but that's the direction I'm going in right now. That's that's just part of it. And Madam, uh, Madam Chair, with your indulgence, I just had two more, but they're connected, but I wanna ask those two questions if that's okay. Yes, please go ahead. Sure, thank, thank you very much for those questions. Vice Chair Spearman. Um, those are complicated topics. I, I want to start with your second, which is about uh, what I call ageism and what the field calls ageism. Uh, and if you invite me back, I'll give you a whole other talk just about that. Uh, but ageism is a form of discrimination, just like any other, uh, in which in our culture and in our society, um, we really have a, a penchant for embracing youth and beauty as the, the standard. Uh, for all people and therefore denying elders uh, the opportunity to truly thrive as active citizens. Um, they often uh, have their views and perspectives diminished. They're discriminated against in a variety of different uh, settings. Um, and, and as you said, there's sort of these thresholds like anyone over 40, well, goodness. But I look around the room, I see many people over 40 uh, who are here with us. And I think many of you would agree with me um, that there is no age at which you lose your productivity. There is no age at which you lose your interest in normal everyday activities. Um, and I, I think it's about helping to educate the public as much as it is the professional workforce in the aging service and healthcare realms um, about the need to be person-centered, that each person is unique and different. And age is just another one of those characteristics um, that needs to be respected uh, from a culturally competent perspective. Now, the one thing that I do argue in my discussions about ageism is that what's interesting about age is that it is the one characteristic uh, that gets discriminated against that we all share. Um, and that it also is the one characteristic in which if you don't see yourself in that form of discrimination today, then discriminating against those people is in essence discriminating against your own future self. Um, so it's a very complicated issue and it, it's one that I think does need a lot of attention. I, I would mention that um, my colleague Barry Gold 
Uh, this was not what he was here to talk about today, but I know AARP uh, actually has a, a wonderful program called Disrupt Aging uh, and Disrupt Ageism, um, which is a training program and also a national campaign to help younger generations recognize uh, the value of elders in our society. Um, and I, I think that is something that needs to be a part of any training programs that we offer uh, for folks, but also just our general messaging to the public. In terms of recruiting healthcare professionals to support older adults, again, I, I think that it's as much about recruiting people into the health disciplines as it is into the geriatrics specialties. I have embraced the, that philosophy that HRSA uh, has put forward that I mentioned in, in my remarks, um, that we will not be able to train enough specialists uh, to support the aging of the population, that what we need is all healthcare professionals to understand their role in supporting older adults and to understand what they can do in, in treating and, and caring for older persons. And, and so I think that the workforce issue really for me, as much as it's about recruitment, um, it's about training. You know, we, we need to increase our recruitment of health professionals overall, right? We need to get a stronger pipeline of people coming into all the healthcare disciplines. And then we need to be sure that all of those healthcare disciplines at every level are receiving uh, education and training about geriatrics and about aging. Because we can't count on specialists to be the sole providers for uh, what? A fifth of our population. And so Madam Chair, with your indulgence, uh, the, uh, that goes along with the, the the next thing I was going to say is uh, a couple of years ago, a couple of sessions ago, we um, had a bill that required uh, cultural competency training uh, for everyone who's in the uh, medical profession or, or in medical facilities. And perhaps that's something that we need to look at including in the cultural competency um, requirements. Uh, you mentioned something about, well, COVID and long haulers, and I'm seeing more and more people who uh, survive COVID, but the long hauler um, um, vicissitudes, if you will, are exacerbating some uh, illnesses that naturally come with aging. Is there anything from a policy perspective that we probably need to look at with respect from uh, to, to healthcare, uh, both now and in the future? Is there something that this committee should look at uh, with respect to bringing forward some type of uh, BDR legislative uh, <clears throat> um, uh, language that would help in that respect? Good question. Um, I, I'm not sure I have a specific legislative suggestion for you in this regard, but what I will say is that a lot of, well, most of the chronic diseases that older adults experience are the result of the accumulation of risk throughout their entire lives. So we're talking about physical activity, diet, as well as social determinants of health and the conditions in which they have lived their lives. And these are the things that result in diabetes, hypertension, COPD, later in life, right? And so I think that if we could use both a reactive approach, meaning we're supporting people who have those conditions through secondary prevention and healthcare, right? So increasing the resources available through things like chronic care management, which is a Medicare benefit, enrolling and promoting people and getting chronic care management services or ongoing care coordination for those specific chronic diseases once they have them. I think from a healthcare perspective, that could be really beneficial. But then not only being reactive, being proactive and moving upstream and putting more investment into health education and community-based wellness programs. And I recognize this is a lifelong accumulation of risk, but really I'm thinking about people in their 40s, 50s, and 60s who need the knowledge and the skills and the tools to engage in physical activity, better diets, healthier foods, et cetera, um, to help to reduce the development of those conditions. I think that could be really beneficial. Yeah, and last last question. Um, we we talked a lot about the um, aging in general. Uh, there's a a part of the whole discussion that um, is left out either by design or default, and that is what does that look like for um, uh, BIPOC communities and specifically for LGBTQ. Uh, when you look at loneliness and isolation. Uh, members of the LGBTQ community are probably, I think it's like three times more likely to complete suicide than their um, heteronormative counterparts. Uh, when you look at quality of life issues, you're still talking about the same ratio, three to four times uh, more likely not to have those sorts of things. 
And what are we doing with respect to making sure that we recognize, I know uh, a single woman, uh, Benitez Thomas, uh, Thompson uh, had a bill, I wanna say it was 2015 and 2017 that required some additional training CEUs with respect to recognizing suicide ideation, but it was across the population. But what we've seen in COVID is that that isolation has exacerbated those statistics. And so people who are isolated now, whether they're in the general population and even the LGBTQ population are more likely to have the suicide ideation. I wanna say it's like four times as much, three times as likely to uh, have a plan and then carry out that plan so to complete suicide ideation. So again, what is it that we need to know uh, and be looking at with respect as policymakers? And can any of this be addressed when we start talking about um, curriculum at the schools of medicine here in Nevada, both public and private? Yeah, absolutely. Again, thank, thank you very much for that question. And um, there were a lot of different elements loaded into that question. So I'm gonna do my best. Um, I, I wanna start with, um, where you started, which is the BIPOC communities and aging services. I, I can tell you just in my career working with aging services professionals, uh, both in healthcare as well as in the community supports, um, that I, I have never come across a person who does not embrace and recognize the need for promoting diversity and inclusion among the people that we are serving and to ensure that all the programs that we're developing are accessible to all. Uh, irrespective of race, sexual orientation, et, et cetera. Um, and particularly economic need, I think is one of the greatest aspects of diversity that we deal with um, in aging services. So uh, there is a goal within aging services programs of serving the broader community and doing so in a way that's reflective of the demographics of society. Um, and one of the challenges I think that we have is not our intention or our, our, our good hopes for doing so, um, but really building the necessary long-term trusting relationships uh, with communities of color and, and other diverse communities um, such that they see the programs that we're offering as appropriate and beneficial to them. And I think that can only come through fostering more discussion, more robust engagement, um, and really thinking together about what's going to best meet the needs of, of communities. I will say from the task force on Alzheimer's disease side, um, our, our vice chair uh, for the TFAD is Tina Dorch, who's with the Office of Minority Health, um, and she has led the development of our recommendations related to cultural competence and ensuring that Alzheimer's disease and dementia-related supports and services are appropriate for a variety of different diverse communities. Um, so we have a very particular emphasis on that, but I think it's something that needs to go deeper uh, than just a recommendation in a state plan, right? It's about the relationships at the community level that need to be fostered to help communities understand the relevance of the programs that are available to them and to help the professionals offering those programs understand how to best engage with communities who are traditionally underserved. And then that knowledge, as you pointed out, if I can just take it a little further to your next elements, uh, that knowledge does need to be disseminated within the curricula uh, of all of the health professions. I, I know we have a very strong Office of Diversity at the School of Medicine at UNR. Uh, it's led by Dr. Uh, Nicole Jacobs, and she develops all manner of different diversity initiatives for engaging our students and helping them recognize uh, the need for learning about how to serve diverse communities, but also our faculty and faculty development programs that help us build our capacity to extend that knowledge out into the community, both through clinical services and through the relationships with a whole host of different partners. So again, I think there's a high level of commitment to supporting these things um, and that it is a journey of learning that that is still underway in terms of how we do that most effectively uh, but it is something that's infused both into curricula as well as for the professional work of both current and future professionals in healthcare thank you thank you madam chair thank you vice chair and um a quick question. I mean, does anybody else have questions on our committee? Again, thank you, Vice Chair Spearman. Those were some really great questions. And uh, Dr. Reed, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, it was very thought provoking. So thank you very much. Okay, for our next agenda item, we have um, Mr. Charles Wart, direct, Nevada Director of Public Policy. Sorry, there's an echo. It's oh, there. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
As I was saying, Mr. Charles Dwart, Nevada Director of Public Policy and Advocacy for the Alzheimer's Association, to present on the current status of Alzheimer patients and services in Nevada. We'd also like to welcome Ms. Kathy Maupin. I hope I pronounced that correctly. My apologies if I didn't. A caregiver and volunteer for the Alzheimer's Association. Again, we'll take questions at the conclusion of the presentation. You may begin when you're ready. Thank you, Chair Gorlo and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Charles Duart. I am the Nevada Public Policy and Advocacy Director for the Alzheimer's Association. It's a pleasure being here today. Uh, Dr. Reed is always a tough act to follow, as is Barry Gold, but I'll do my best to be brief and, and provide information that's helpful to the committee. You've already heard a lot of good testimony, and I would say that you're saving the best for last, but um, that, that some of the, uh, the testimony you've already heard has been excellent. You know, a lot of us come to our work here at the Alzheimer's Association because of connections we have through family and friends, and for me it was my father who passed away in 2003 with from Alzheimer's, and it's currently a very good friend of mine who's my age who had younger onset dementia and is still living with that. Um, and for my guest here, uh, Kathy Maupin, uh, she has a similar journey that she wants to share with you folks. Kathy is a uh, an advocate, an educator. She is a support group facilitator um, and a volunteer extraordinaire for the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, she also advocates on federal policy for us uh, with members of Congress. And so we're very grateful to have Kathy here to tell you a little bit about her story. And at the conclusion of her comments, what I'll do is to uh, start the formal uh, uh, part of my presentation. So I'm going to turn it over to Kathy right now. Thank you, Chuck. I appreciate that so much. Um, good afternoon to Chair Garlo, Gorlo and to members of the committee. Um, I'm here today to provide insight into the role of the caregiver and the experiences that I've had in dealing with this disease. So what's it like to be a caregiver? I'm going to give you an analogy. As a parent, I rejoiced in all the achievements of my children learning to walk, to talk, to dress themselves. They learn to eat and brush their teeth, use the bathroom, and they learn to read and write. Caring for someone with Alzheimer's is the exact opposite. Even though I was her daughter, I became the parent to my mother. I despaired as I watched my mother lose her ability to walk and to talk, to dress herself and to brush her teeth. She became incontinent. She forgot how to read and write, and she depended upon me to help her with all of the activities of daily living. I dressed her. I fed her pureed foods with a spoon because it was hard for her to swallow. I pushed her around in a wheelchair. My children reached out their arms to hug and to love me. My mom had no idea who I was, and she shunned my hugs. I delighted in my children gaining their independence. I cried as my mother lost hers. Nancy Reagan called this disease the long goodbye, but I call it death by inches because I watched and grieved as my mother lost little bits and pieces of herself every week, every month, every year for 22 years until she simply existed, silent, unmoving, completely helpless, existing in her own world totally dependent upon me and caregivers for everything. She couldn't even open her eyes. Alzheimer's is a cruel disease for the person who has it, but it's a cruel disease for the caregiver. For caregivers, it's physically demanding, emotionally devastating, and it's financially disastrous. I see evidence every support group meeting of the toll that this disease takes on my caregivers. Many of my members are seeing a counselor to address their emotional health issues. They feel hopeless, guilty, depressed, isolated, and some have even been suicidal. Some attend AA meetings because they use alcohol to deaden their fears or to seek sleep or an escape from the daily demands of caregiving. Some have substance abuse issues and have gone into rehab. Physically, some of my members have suffered from heart and vascular problems due to stress and lack of sleep. Some have hip, knee, and back issues from lifting wheelchairs and their loved ones. Imagine what it's like to have a hip or a knee surgery and be caring for someone you love. 
Almost all experience exhaustion as they care for a loved one 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Many of the caregivers in my support group are caring for a loved one alone, with no family to provide support or respite for them, or they're at odds with family members who don't understand this disease, offer no help, and challenge everything that the caregiver does. Rather than pull families together, Alzheimer's often rips families apart, which then further adds to the caregiver's isolation and the emotional and physical stress of caregiving. Many of the caregivers in my group have had to quit their, quit their jobs due to the demands of caregiving, which leaves them in trouble financially. Many are losing the most financially productive years in their careers. Retirement savings are then also decreased. Some take care of their loved one during the day and work from home at night, often getting only three hours of sleep, sometimes none. Paying for in-home help daycare or respite care further strains already tight budgets. I'm here to say that caregivers need help. They need an accurate and timely diagnosis of loved ones so that medical, legal, and financial plans can be put in place. In 22 years, I was never once told that my mother had Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. I saw her diagnosis in medical records when they were lying open on a counter while a doctor took a phone call. We could have planned so much better if I had known what her diagnosis was. Medical personnel need education about this disease, especially how to manage hospitalized Alzheimer's um, patients. I had um, a support group member recently be asked to stay 24 hours a day to take care of her, her, her um, father while he was hospitalized for pneumonia. Um, they just said they were short staffed, they couldn't handle his getting out of bed, his ripping out IVs, his oxygen. She could not possibly stay for four or five days with him 24 hours a day. Respite care, mental health and substance abuse services, affordable legal services and other resources geared toward, geared toward caregivers would be helpful in keeping caregivers healthy and engaged in caregiving. I am hopeful that during this coming session of the legislature that we can find ways to provide the help and support that our caregivers need. I am so grateful for the time that you have given me today to listen to my story. And should you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them when you're ready. Chuck. Thank you very much, Kathy. And it's a pleasure being up here today to hear your story um, and to be able to talk about some of the needs that the people that we advocate for have right now, including their families and caregivers. Um, one of the things I want to put out there is I want to thank uh, Assemblywoman Gorlo and Vice Chair Spearman for the work that they did last session on forwarding a bill, Assembly Bill 216, which Barry Gold mentioned um, in his presentation to help uh, individuals who are not Medicare age get access to cognitive assessments and care planning. It's yet to be implemented by the Division of Healthcare Financing and Policy, but we look forward to its implementation and hopefully can help in uh, getting that information out to the physician community who could use those services to help with their, their senior patients. Um, in terms of my presentation, I have up here a list of uh, some of the areas I'd like to touch on. Before I go any further, I want to mention that um, I, I will address or hopefully will make some suggestions related to um, geriatric workforce training. Uh, from Senator Spearman, as well as some of her questions around outreach and education to communities of color and the LGBTQ communities. So I'll talk a, a little bit about that at the end of my presentation. Um, before I go on and talk about national facts and figures, one of the things I think that's important is to define terms. And one of the, the terms we have to understand is the difference between uh, Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So. Dementia is an umbrella term for symptoms such as a decline in memory, reasoning, or thinking. Dementia is not normal aging. Alzheimer's disease is a specific type of dementia and accounts for about 60 to 80 percent of all dementia cases. You can also see dementia-like behaviors in other diseases, some of which are treatable, like depression, 
stroke, thyroid disease, even urinary tract infections. That's why it's so important that uh, when you experience problems with cognition, thinking, reasoning, memory, or your loved one has problems like that, to see a doctor and get a diagnosis because some of these things can be treated. For the Alzheimer's Association, the emphasis on an early and accurate diagnosis is important for other reasons, and in particular, to allow somebody who may have dementia or Alzheimer's disease the opportunity to be a full participant in their care planning in the early stages of the disease. And so uh, we really do advocate for um, the expansion of uh, access to early uh, diagnosis. So in terms of national facts and figures, um, the Alzheimer's Association puts out a report every year uh, called its Facts and Figures Report. And more re most recently, they've uh, put out information that there's an estimated 6 million Americans who are living with Alzheimer's disease, and those numbers are rapidly increasing. It's estimated that by 2050, those numbers are expected to reach almost 13 million individuals. The other thing that's important for people living with dementia or Alzheimer's disease is the importance of caregivers, uh, in particular family caregivers and friends. Uh, the Alzheimer's Association estimates that there are over 11, Amer 11 million Americans who are providing unpaid care to individuals living with dementia. It's estimated that they provide more than 15 billion hours of unpaid care that if you were to try to put a value on it, would reach nearly a quarter of a trillion dollars a year. And that's an incredible amount of support that the health system and uh, organizations are getting from unpaid caregivers. And this is why we support caregiving and the caregivers uh, through the association's work. So getting a dementia diagnosis, as some have already mentioned, is not an easy task. And uh, for individuals who would otherwise have a diagnosis of, uh, or meet the criteria for Alzheimer's disease or other dementias, they aren't diagnosed by a physician. And that's related to a variety of different reasons and have been studied, and some of that includes a lack of access to care, uh, fear, or even just thinking that it's part of normal aging, which it isn't. The other important aspect here, and, and Kathy spoke to this earlier, is that research shows that half of Medicare beneficiaries with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or another dementia in their charts, half of them are even told that they have dementia. And so quite often they're never told, nor is a caregiver ever told that this person has dementia. And so again, having an early and accurate diagnosis provided to the patient and the caregiver is extremely important and one of the reasons we advocate for it. So, you know, one of the things that, um, and I'll be frank about this, we were a little disappointed in Elders Count 2021 because there was zero mention of Alzheimer's disease or dementia in that report, as it is such an important uh, part of uh, aging and more uh, prevalent uh, as, as our senior population, particularly here in Nevada, ages. But one of the things that uh, I know that Jeff Duncan mentioned is that they're going to add it to the 2023 report, and we're grateful for that addition. But it's important to know that while other diseases, like heart disease, for example, we've seen deaths from heart disease decrease in the last 20 years, there's actually been an increase of almost 145% in deaths from Alzheimer's disease. Um, and likewise, we've seen deaths from uh, different types of cancers go down while, while, while deaths from Alzheimer's disease increase. And that's probably an underestimate because, again, it's often difficult to get a diagnosis. And if you do, you may not even know or be told that you have the disease. And in fact, one in three seniors dies with Alzheimer's or another dementia. And I specifically use the words here, dies with Alzheimer's disease. Because if you talk to a physician or clinician or even family members who've gone through that journey with a loved one, um, oftentimes somebody who has Alzheimer's disease doesn't die from the disease itself. 
it causes other problems, and very frequently it's things like aspiration pneumonia or failure to thrive because they can't eat or drink anymore. That's really the direct cause of death. But it's really the Alzheimer's disease or dementia that leads to that uh, conclusion. I'm going to skip this slide here. You know, I know Senator Spearman has asked these questions repeatedly today, and, and I want to make sure that we put this out there. Um, last year, the Alzheimer's Association, as a part of its uh, 2021 Facts and Figures report, put out a special report, and, and they called it, specifically, they called out discrimination in care. And one of the things that they put out in this report is the, the unequal burden of, of Alzheimer's disease amongst different communities or populations. Um, we know that blacks are about two times to two and a half times more likely than whites to have Alzheimer's disease or another dementia. Hispanics are 1.5 to two times more likely than whites. And yet these groups, these same groups, believe it's harder to get good care for themselves. It should be noted that uh, because of the burden of Alzheimer's disease on communities of color, the disproportionate burden, caregivers in those com communities are also disproportionately affected. As a part of the report, the 2021 Facts and Figures report on discrimination in care, surveys were done by the association of different, different groups. And what they found was striking in that 50% of black Americans, 42% of Native Americans, 34% of Asian Americans, and 33% of Hispanic Americans believe discrimination is a barrier to good care for dementia or Alzheimer's disease. And so the fact that they're not seeking care or getting a diagnosis may in part be due to this belief that they are being discriminated against. And it's a strong belief that is often borne out by research. The cost burden of Alzheimer's disease is extremely high for the United States. Um, it is considered the most expensive disease. Um, and in 2021, uh, the, the U.S. spent a combined $355 billion on Alzheimer's disease, a lot of that in the long-term care arena. By 2050, that number is expected to increase to more than $1 trillion a year. In addition, and Kathy mentioned this as well, is, is that you know, we hear from caregivers often that because of the burden of care, they often have to quit their jobs or take part-time jobs. And, and so financially, you know, often in, in the middle of life, having to be a caregiver uh, over an extended period can result in financial devastation. And if you look at this chart, the thing I really want to point out is the huge out-of-pocket expense borne by families and individuals with disease uh, to pay for care. So of that $355 billion of annual uh, Alzheimer's care that I mentioned, 21% of that is borne by individuals and families through out-of-pocket expenses, the stuff that Medicare doesn't cover or health insurance won't cover. And so it, it has a huge disproportionate burden as well on uh, communities of color when they have to uh, deal with out-of-pocket expenses. Next, I'm going to talk about some specific Nevada facts and figures. Um, and uh, again, you know, the graying of Nevada, I think, is uh, an, an issue that we're going to be talking about today and one that we're going to continue to contend with. Um, and so every year, as a part of their facts and figures report, the Alzheimer's Association puts out state-specific information. And so um, this is information from the 2021 Facts and Figures report. There's some updated informa information I'll mention from the 2022 report, which was issued on uh, March 15th, but I'll, I'll get into that in a bit. But two really important aspects of the, this particular slide are that Nevada has the third fastest rate of growth of individuals with dementia in the United States, just behind Vermont and Arizona, who are respectively number two and number one in the nation. Um, we are expected to see a 31% increase in the growth of individuals with, uh, living with dementia or Alzheimer's disease by 2025, not 2050, 2025. And so that number, right now we are estimated that individuals 65 and older with Alzheimer's is around 49,000 Nevadans. That number will increase to 64,000. 
A special study was also done of individuals with dementia in nursing homes and the excess number of deaths that occurred but with individuals who had a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or another dementia who were in nursing facilities in Nevada. And there were 678 basically um, COVID-related uh, nursing home deaths for individuals with Alzheimer's disease uh, in nursing facilities. And I've mentioned this before, in Nevada, there was an increase of 248% in Alzheimer's-related deaths since 2000. So in the last 21 years, an increase of 248% in Alzheimer's deaths um, here in the state of Nevada. In terms of the cost uh, burden on Nevada, uh, again, Alzheimer's is extremely expensive. For Medicare in Nevada, the average annual cost of care is $36,000. Medicaid pays over $203 million for individuals with Alzheimer's disease, and most of this is in the long-term care and support uh, aspects of their program. Um, patients with Alzheimer's also are expensive users of hospital services, often visiting the emergency room. Um, and so the cost burden on our state health system as well as the federal health system, Medicare, uh, is tremendous. I mentioned caregivers being an important part of the advocacy work we do at the Alzheimer's Association. There's an estimated 48,000 Nevadans who are providing unpaid care to individuals living with dementia. Uh, the association estimates that that uh, is equivalent, they're providing an equivalent of 78 million hours a year of unpaid care, which is valued at $1.3 billion. We also know from surveys of caregivers in Nevada that 80% of them have a, a chronic medical condition. 18% of them have depression. And uh, Nevada provides, it's, it's the 10th highest state in the nation in terms of the number of hours of unpaid caregiving provided to people living with dementia. One of the things that I mentioned was that there was some more recent uh, data released um, in the 2022 facts and figures report. I apologize, I couldn't incorporate it into the slides because uh, I had to hand them in a little bit before the uh, report was released. But just to sort of update some of these facts and figures for Nevada, um, again, I mentioned that 80% of, of Nevada caregivers have one or more chronic conditions. In terms of the need of geriatricians, these are specially trained physicians in geriatrics. We're anticipating that by 2050, we'll need to see an increase of about 267% in the number of geriatricians uh, serving Nevadans uh, who may have dementia. Um, in the 2022 report, there is also a reference to a, a, a study that was done on neurology deserts. Um, I believe it was uh, Dr. Reed who mentioned that geriatricians and neurologists are really the individual specialists that um, are involved in differential diagnosing of uh, different types of dementias and are critical to that type of, of diagnostic work. Nevada is considered uh, one of 20 states that it's a neurology desert. And so it's going to become more and more important for us to train physicians, particularly family physicians uh, and other primary care providers, including nurse practitioners and physician assistants, to be more competent in the care of, of their aging patients. Apologize for that. So one of the things that uh, the Department of Health and Human Services here does is every other year they conduct a survey on uh, what's called subjective cognitive decline. And what that basically means is um, it's self-reported memory problems that have been getting worse over the past year. And so this is part of a survey that's done, a very broad survey uh, called the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. And one of the areas they look at is cognitive decline for individuals 45 years of age or older. And um, in those individuals, one in seven report subjective cognitive decline. So again, that's a problem with memory or reasoning um, that is getting worse. 82% um, of these people who report subjective co cognitive decline also have a chronic medical condition. What's also interesting and somewhat disturbing is that less than half of those people who experience subjective and report subjective cognitive decline actually talk to anybody 
or including a family member about their concerns and 50% don't talk to a, uh, a healthcare provider about it. So this leads to a gross under underdiagnosing of, of Alzheimer's disease and dementia or late diagnostic work which occurs in individuals in the middle stages of the disease where it's much more obvious and again at a point where they really can't be fully involved in their own care planning and financial affairs. So next, what I'm going to talk about is some of the work that I do uh, here in Nevada, and that's to talk about our state policy priorities. And, you know, one of the things I'm going to stay, say right up front is um, some of these things aren't cheap. But given the, the aging of our, our state um, and the aging population that we need to try to serve, I think it's important that we hear some of these ideas and find ways for us to make them more affordable because, again, we know that Nevada Medicaid spends over $200 million a year just on long-term care, nursing home care making up the biggest part of that spend. And so looking at ways to invest uh, in programs and services upstream from downstream events like nursing home care uh, is extremely important and a relatively small investment uh, to, for the future needs of, of Nevadans. Um, the association has four uh, public policy platforms. Um, these are consistent, uh, a consistent state of, uh, excuse me, a consistent set of state policy priorities that um, we implement across chapters and across states. And so those include an increasing public awareness for the importance of an early diagnosis, building a dementia-capable workforce, increasing home and community-based services, and enhancing the quality of care in residential settings. What we do as public policy folks at the state level is we try to translate this into actions that can be taken, uh, either legislative or appropriation actions that, be, that can be taken by state legislatures or by the governor in, in the development of their budget work. And um, I'm gonna talk about three policy priorities. I can say up front that we're grateful uh, that the Cleveland Clinic, Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health, supports these three initiatives, um, as well as AERP Nevada. And I'll talk in more detail about each of these, but number one is better access to early and accurate diagnosis. And I'll talk about a proposal for establishing a Nevada memory network. Number two, better Medicaid supports for family caregivers. And I'll talk about uh, different programs across the nation which can serve as models for modifying our existed home, existing home and community-based waiver for the frail elderly. And then third, um, helping individuals and families who are dealing with a dementia crisis. And we'll talk about uh, the experience in other states and, and programs that have uh, been borne out to be very successful in other states. So we'll be talking about each of those. Um, my first uh, proposal here is the Nevada Me Memory Network, and these in, are not in any order of importance. But um, I've been privileged to work with um, uh, Dr. Peter Reed and the Sanford Center on Aging, as well as uh, renowned neurology department, and have had uh, initial talks uh, with the Cleveland Clinic Luruvo Center about establishing a more robust network of uh, memory clinics. These are memory assessment clinics, or MACs, that really would serve uh, multiple purposes. And this is based off of proven work that's been done at Emory University at, and the University of California, San Francisco, as well as the University of Wisconsin. Um, I can also say that we have good bones here in Nevada. We have, as Dr. Reed mentioned, uh, very good uh, schools of medicine that include geriatric workforce enhancement program grants, we have partners like the Ruvo Center for Brain Health, and down at UNLV, we have the uh, UNLV uh, Brain Health Department that's doing excellent research, and also the Sanford Center for Aging. So we have good bones to build on, and that's what we want to propose here. So I'm going to go to a graphic that kind of explains what we're talking about, and we're having very serious conversations right now between the Sanford Center on Aging and uh, renowned neurology department about establishing this. Uh, Las Vegas is fortunate to have the Lou Ruvo Center, which provides uh, these memory assessment services. We need to develop a more complete capability up in northern and rural Nevada 
uh, through this initiative, we hope to do that. But we know that primary care providers would form the basis of any network for doing uh, cognitive assessments. And so uh, one of the things that we know is essential, and Dr. Reed talked to, about this, is primary care education. And so this would be using experts at the MACs or memory assessment clinics, which would include neurologists, neuropsychologists, um, and other clinical um, uh, clinicians to really help primary care practices effectively screen patients so that when they make a referral to a memory assessment clinic, it's a quality referral with good information backing up that, that service. And so it's, it's a two-way street between the MAC and the PCP. When the patient and the caregiver, now this dyad of individuals, the patient and the caregiver is extremely important to be included in any kind of cognitive assessment work. Um, when they go to the MAC, they are both assessed in terms of their capabilities and needs, and then a full comprehensive diagnostic workup is done by the MAC. And when that's done, the caregiver is given that information as well as the patient. And then that care plan is handed off back to the PCP to take care of that patient um, in the communities where they live. And so the PCP can provide ongoing medical support uh, with help from uh, the neurologist or neuropsychologist at the MAC. But what's also very, very important, and this is played out through the work at Emory University as well as UCSF, has been uh, care navigators. Care navigators are basically social workers who s really support people with a diagnosis uh, as well as their caregivers in the community to make sure they're getting the social services and supports they need and monitoring the, the care and well-being of the caregivers themselves, not just the patient. Because we've heard how often caregivers suffer as a result of the burden of care that they're providing. So this sort of cycle of care is extremely important and um, we're, like I said, looking at developing a model uh, based off of good work that's been done in other states. The other program I want to mention is um, a family caregiver waiver. Again, we heard really good presentations this morning from uh, the Department of Health and Human Services staff, particularly those in uh, the Aging and Disability Services Division, about the work that they're doing, keeping people out of nursing homes and providing in-home supports for individuals, uh, including those who are on the Nevada Medicaid home and community-based waiver for the frail elderly. And what this program uh, looks at is really augmenting the work that's going on in that frail elderly waiver and to provide a way of assessing caregiver needs particularly. And so what they've done in other states, and this has been researched by the uh, National Academy of State Health Policy or NASHB, um, they put out a report on excellent programs across, uh, across the nation. And again, Georgia stands out as one of those areas where they're doing excellent work. And what they really are doing is keeping in touch with the caregiver. So the state social worker or case manager is staying in close contact through a case management system with the caregiver who puts in their notes about what, what the patient needs, the beneficiary in this case needs in terms of ongoing care, but also what the caregiver needs. And the state social worker or case manager puts together a training program, not just a service program, but a training program for the caregiver to help them uh, do the job they need to do that's patient-centered, person-centered for not only uh, the, the patient receiving the services, but also for the caregiver. And so this structured process of training and caregiver support is what states are doing to more effectively take care of individuals to, and keep them in their home. They're also making it easier to pay family caregivers uh, to, to do this work. Um, in Nevada, we do that same thing. It's not as easy as in other states to get paid as a family caregiver, and sometimes it's um, not allowed to have a spouse or a guardian provide that care. But in, in some states that are doing a good job of this, they are allowing spouses and, and guardians to serve as paid caregivers. And so we would look to the Division of Aging and Disability Services to uh, basically augment the waiver that they already have in place and hopefully this wouldn't be uh, extremely expensive to do but it really would provide the kind of supports and training that people need to be uh, more effective caregivers. The final proposal I want to talk about is something called a dementia care specialist program and um, 
I had an opportunity and still have an opportunity. I sit in on a coalition of uh, care providers, social workers, and mobile safety team, uh, mobile outreach safety team members, which include law enforcement officers, on a monthly call uh, that's chaired by Jessica Flood Abras. And, and Jessica is one of our uh, rural behavioral health coordinators, uh, and she does an excellent job of uh, coordinating these calls. And what we've increasingly heard from county social workers and law enforcement are increasing uh, uh, incidences of dementia-related crises that they get involved with. And these are individuals explaining uh, uh, behaviors that are at risk, putting them at risk or putting others at risk. And as with mental health crises, this often results in somebody with potential a dementia diagnosis getting handcuffed, thrown in the back of a patrol car, taken to a hospital emergency room where they may not be able to make a diagnosis, providing them, who then provides them with psychiatric medication management, which is inappropriate, or they may end up in a, in a mental health hospital ward. And all of these are inappropriate interventions, and uh, law enforcement recognizes this, county social workers recognize this, but they don't have somebody in the field who's helping them with these crisis uh, situations, who can serve as a resource uh, for ongoing support. And so we look to the state of Wisconsin, which developed this, and back in 2016, the legislature heard about this from uh, these kinds of crises from law enforcement, from social work staff, um, and they funded a small number of positions. I believe they funded six positions, which were called dementia care specialists. And these were a master's level trained people who really served as the front line on, in dementia crises uh, interventions and post-crisis stabilization work, but they were also involved in training communities to be more dementia friendly and dementia capable, including some of these community organizations like mobile outreach safety teams. And these have been very, very effective, so much so that the Wisconsin legislature um, in their 2020 session, I believe, approved 64 positions uh, dementia crisis specialists, um, and these are one specialist per county. Um, and so they felt it was such an important aspect of the work that's, not, that's needed for people experiencing these types of crises, whether it's in, in the home, in the community, or even in a nursing home, um, that they, they funded position in each county. Um, the states of Georgia and Maryland are looking at this program as we are. And the Alzheimer's Association here in Nevada is, is working very closely with the UNR DEER program, or Dementia Education Engagement and Research Program, um, as well as ADSD. Um, and we'll, we are working with, uh, talking with uh, law enforcement and also um, county social workers about moving a similar program forward. Certainly not as ambitious as 64 positions, but we want to start someplace uh, we are looking at grant funding uh, with the help of ADSD, but that grant support would need to be uh, continued with appropriations uh, and ongoing uh, financial support from the legislature. So again, this is based off a proven model out of Wisconsin that other states are looking to emulate because of the growing incidences of dementia crises that are occurring across their states and we're hearing across Nevada. So the work that we do at the association is not only uh, state level work, we do federal work. Um, one of the things that we really focus on, on at the federal level, and Kathy is one of our ambassadors, uh, which means she works very closely with one of our members of Congress, uh, Congressman Amoday, who's been very, very supportive of the association's policy positions and funding. Um, but one of the things that we really work hard on is looking at increasing research funding at the federal and at the National Institutes of Health around Alzheimer's disease.